the most out of the sessions and, and see them um, in the future a little bit more slowly. Um, so, um, yeah, so uh, Sharon, are, are you here? Um, all right, how about uh, Abhilash? Okay, all right. Um, and Bushan? Yes, I'm here. All right, where, where are you coming from, Bushan? Uh, I'm from India. Oh, great. Well, uh, welcome. Yeah, uh, uh, let's see. Um, Dr. Uh, Bashi Prad, I recognize you from. Hi, yeah. Hi, good to see you again. Yeah, I'm actually now in New York at the moment, finally. Oh, great. All right. Well, welcome. Welcome to the States. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, Mavada, I hope I'm pronouncing this right. Are you here? All right, I got a I got a text from so Babada. Okay, you're here. Is is it possible to get your mic on? Just right you what? Sorry. Um, let's see. So Babada, if I could get your just just like you know say something into the mic if you, if you're here, um, then then it'll be a little bit easier to call on you later. Um, Sam J, are you are you here? Yes. All right. Well, welcome. Where are you coming from, Sam J? Dallas. Dallas. All right. Welcome. Yeah, you're near, nearby. I'm in Louisiana. Um. So and then Ume. Am I pronouncing that right? Hi. Okay, uh, I'm I'm Ume Kairosu from Bangladesh, and I'm living in Chicago. Oh, amazing. All right. Well, welcome. Um, all right, so so the first thing I do is, uh, I, this is kind of like, um, I'm choosing to do an explanation that I've never done before, so bear with me, but I have kind of a, a uh, learning mnemonic for, for shock, and uh, we'll just do this real quick before we get started. Um, I thought it was kind of a cute way to remember it. It might not be your cup of tea, so just bear with me and we'll, we'll see if you guys like it. Um, I'm going to see if I can't get this whiteboard to clear out and I'll draw something on the whiteboard. Um, so, here we go. Yeah, so I got my tools right here. Okay, so I can draw. Um, so, uh, I, I created this mnemonic. It might not be your, uh, your favorite way to understand this, but I, I, I think that shock questions are super um, difficult in a time condition setting to answer. And so I always like to um, understand them on, uh, it, I, I like to understand the things that I'm going to be answering questions on in multiple ways. So that if I'm trying to remember how to do something on an exam, the, the, um, the ability to recall what it is that I need to remember in order to get the question right is coming from multiple directions in multiple different formats. So um, what I do is I write a little N here. So uh, has anybody been to Ecuador? Have you guys been to Ecuador at all? It's a country in yeah. South, okay. It's, it's a country in South America. It's not that touristy a, a country, but they have something called a Pisco Sour. And it's a, it's a drink called the Pisco Sour. So it's P-I, S C O. Actually, I'm going to redraw this so it's a little bit cleaner. So P I S C O. That's how you spell pisco, which is it's a type of drink that they have in Peru and Ecuador. It's like a created by the Incas, and it's a, it's an alcoholic beverage. I, I assume it's created by the Incas. It's, it's definitely a Quechua drink, um, and so. Uh, like a drink that people who speak Quechua, the indigenous population there, drink Pisco on occasion. And, um, and so, uh, you know, I, I try to remember this as a mnemonic for what we're about to do. So, uh, and then I write in shock at the top. But I spell it S-H-O-C. So, um, 
a lot of these shot questions are up arrow, down arrow questions. And just to identify whether a question is going to be an up arrow, down arrow question is nice because you can start to think about what you really, what's the bare minimum you need to know in order to check your work and, and then move on and move on to the next question. Because you only have 90 seconds per question on the step one exam. Um, and so this is kind of like a reference if you're struggling to answer a question, if you've identified the type of shock and they're asking you whether or not something will go up or down, this is a nice way to do it. So the P stands for uh, pulmonary, I'm, I'm gonna change the color. So this is pulmonary um, capillary wedge pressure. Do you guys know what pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is like a surrogate measure of? Left atrial pressure. Exactly, left atrial pressure. So um, pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is left atrial pressure and it's also kind of like a surrogate measure for whether or not you're receiving additional blood from the left ventricle or you're receiving additional blood coming from the pulmonary circulation. So you might remember that you have the pulmonary circulation and then you have the heart chambers, you know, and there's four heart chambers, right? And so the pulmonary, uh, pulmonary circulation is, so blood's coming in through the inferior vena cava, it's coming into the right atrium, and then it's coming out of the right ventricle into the lungs. It's going through the pulmonary circulation, uh, like the intra, the, what they call the intrapulmonary circulation. And then they have, and, and this area here, all of this is the pulmonary circulation. And this is the systemic circulation that goes out to your body, to your brain, to your, to your heart actually, to your, to your heart muscle, and to your limbs, to your organs and everything else. And so you really do have two separate circulations. You have the respiratory circulation, you have the cardiac circulation. So the, the pulmonary circulation um, output is actually coming, do you know what this vessel would represent on this terrible drawing? So this would be, this would be your pulmonary, is this your pulmonary vein or your pulmonary artery? Pulmonary vein. Pulmonary vein, right? So it's, it's one of the only situations, it's actually three situations where you'll have a vein that's like highly oxygenated. And this is one of those weird exceptional situations where actually a vein that all veins return to your heart. And so this vein is coming from your lungs. And so it's going to your heart, but it's oxygenated blood because it is, it's, it's strange for that reason, because it's coming from your lungs to your heart instead of coming from tissue that you're supposed to be supplying with oxygen. You're actually receiving oxygen from the lungs. And so the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is a surrogate measure also of whether you're getting blood that's coming from your lungs into your right atrium. And so, um, and so that's going to come to bear on some of the physiology behind shock that we're going to talk about. But uh, we're just going to do a really brief uh, uh, explanation because, um, uh, because this is just a reference guide for helping you with shock questions. But the pulmonary, pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is a surrogate measure of left atrium. So that's, that's absolutely right. So, um, so uh, do you guys know um, what cardiac index represents? Like, how would you describe what cardiac index is supposed to represent? So, cardiac index kind of represents your cardiac output, your ability for your heart to pump blood out of the left ventricle. Are you guys familiar with that at all? Q. Okay. All right. So, so then we have the cardiac index. So PI, pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, cardiac index, right? So S, um, so this is systemic vascular pressure, or systemic vascular resistance, right? And do you guys know what systemic vascular resistance is like called? There's like a, a term that this would be a surrogate measure of. The mean artery pressure? Yeah, actually that's correct. But, um, uh, and that's probably what, if you were in an ICU's, ICU setting, that's what they would say. But um, another way that you could think about it is, it would be your, 
um, your afterload. So it's just a different way to say it. You're absolutely right. But um, afterload is another, it's, it's, it's a way of thinking of the heart as exerting uh, pressured blood against resistance and against um, the, uh, one of the forms of resistance will be the, you know, the, the caliber of the vessel that it's pumping into, but also the length that it needs to get that uh, fluid to your distal organs and extremities and and so the vascular resistance is a is a confluence of a bunch of different uh, kind of physical forces um, that cause it to be difficult to to take more effort to pump blood against. Um, so they call it afterload, and SVR is kind of approximating that um, afterload. So when we talk about afterload, we're literally talking about what makes it hard to get blood out of your uh, left ventricle. Usually, we're talking of, when we're talking about afterload and preload, we're talking about ventricular. Um, and so, um, do you guys know what CVP is? Central venous pressure. Yeah, so central venous pressure. So what would that be a surrogate measure of? Exactly. It, see, we're, we're doing something like we're taking resistance and we're taking pressure and then we're turning it into a surrogate measure of something that is like conceptual. So when we say preload, like, do you guys know what happens? Do you, do you know how, do you know what preload, how would you explain preload? What would you, how would you define it? So preload is like blood coming back into like the right or left H, uh, ventricle. Usually we're talking about the left ventricle. And so central venous pressure is, is, is preload to the right ventricle. And it has to do with what would your pressure be if you were to measure it at the superior or the inferior vena cava as it comes into the heart, right? So you have the four chambers. You have the right atrium, and you have the inferior and superior vena cava, which is uh, low oxygenated, about 60-50% oxygenated blood is coming in through the superior and inferior vena cava from the stuff above your neck and the stuff below your neck uh, that has already been oxygenated. The blood needs to come back from your lung, from I mean from your liver, or from your um, extremities. And so that's your central venous pressure is going to be a circuit measure of exactly right, your preload. So I'm sorry, I'm taking a lot of time on, on the, at the front end to explain some things, but we're, we're going we're gonna to speed up here. So this is, this is your SpO2. Do you guys know what that, what, what that refers to? Where, where are we talking about the SpO2 measuring oxygen of? Do you guys know? So, so how would you measure SpO2 usually in a hospital? Oximeter. Exactly. And where, where do you put the pulse oximeter? On your finger. On your, on your finger. So you put it on your finger because you want to know how much oxygenated blood is there uh, at the furthest most part of my upper limb. And so they put it on your, hopefully they put it on your middle finger, they put it on a finger that's, you know, distal, as distal as they can, so they can measure, it actually measures specifically it uses red light to measure the, um, the ability of oxygen to saturate hemoglobin. And if the hemoglobin is saturated, the pulse oximeter will pick up on the wavelength that is produced by the electrons on the oxygen that is being affected by its bonding to hemoglobin. And so if you have a desaturated hemoglobin, your pulse oximeter is going to notice that we're getting a, a high, pot, a high uh, preponderance of um, wavelengths which suggest that the hemoglobin is not saturated. And if it's not saturated, then you don't have an oxygenated, you have a lesser percentage of oxygenation at that distal extremity. So that's your SpO2 measurement. And so it's not perfect, but it is a good measurement of, of oxygen, arterial oxygen uh, supply to, to your, to your, uh, to your like distal extremities. And so, um, and so these are all the things that we'll think about when we're talking about shock and what will go up or down in shock, usually with heart catheters and things like that. And so usually they use what's called a Swan-Gantz catheter, which goes through your, um, 
your foramen ovale, it actually punctures through the atrial septum and, uh, and measures your left uh, atrium. And uh, different di di central venous pressures measure, measure differently. You don't have to know that for the exam, but um, it's kind of, uh, you might have to know about the swan dance catheter, actually. That's one of the things you might have to know. But the point of this diagram, a long story uh, long, is that everything in shock goes down until proven otherwise. So what, is, what does that mean? Well, this N represents neurogenic shock, which I am distinguishing from septic shock, even though these are both distributive, right? So distributive really means um, distributed throughout your entire body and, and not caused by one regional location like these other types of shock or one specific concept like these other, uh, like, like you could say that the fluid in your, in your blood, you, in your serum and your, in your red blood cells and what causes you to have perfusion pressure is, is what would cause you to be hyper or hypovolemic. Hypovolemic shock is happening within your vasculature, so that's like all in one place. But neurogenic shock and septic shock are happening all over your body. They're caused by things like neurohormonal release of epinephrine. They're caused by a decrease in vascular tone. They're caused by, you know, uh, problems with RAS, problems with, um, you know, systems that you would use to counteract. And so these are distributive because this has to do with histamine and hypovolemia as a result of third spacing. So hypovolemic shock has to do with whether or not you have enough fluid in your vasculature. Obstructive shock has to do with um, whether or not you can get blood in, um, in and out of your heart. And so the two main types of obstructive um, shock, uh, there's, there's, there's cardio, cardiac tamponade, which can, has many causes, um, which is when your heart is trying to beat against the pericardium and it's not able to get the incompressible fluid out of the, uh, uh, to move out of the way so your ventricles can contract and get the blood out of the heart like a pump. And then there's pulmonary embolisms, which, uh, which are caused by, you know, deep venous thrombosis is usually, which are traveling to the heart and then, um, and then causing a differential of pressure between your right and left heart. And so that's a pulmonary embolism. And then we have cardiogenic shock, which is caused by like dysfunction of the heart, right? And so if you assume that if, if, if I were to correspond pulmonary capillary wedge pressure to neurogenic shock, would you expect there to be, this is a really hard question, so maybe I shouldn't ask this, um, but I guess you would expect that in uh, neurogenic shock, which is caused by decreased vascular tone, which is caused by an inability to create a caliber of blood vessel that your blood can be pumped through because you're not able to increase the pressure in the vasculature if the caliber is too large for the vessel, the fluid isn't being compressed by the, by the by your vasculature and therefore you're not moving the blood, that your pulmonary capillary wedge pressure might be low because you're not able to get the blood to the heart. And if you're not able to get the blood to the heart, then you're not able to get it to the lungs. And if you're not able to get it to the lungs, then you're not able to get it to the left atrium. And this is a surrogate measure of your left atrial pressure, right? So this is gonna be down. Your cardiac index is gonna be down because you're not gonna be able to get it out of the heart if you can't get it to the left atrium. Your systemic vascular resistance is the problem in neurogenic shock, so you're not going to be able to get that up. And um, your central venous pressure is a measure of your, what, your superior and inferior vena cava pressure, your right atrial pressure. So you're not able, which is usually identical. And so you're not able to, um, you're not able to uh, get that to be increased. And your SpO2 is going to be decreased because you're not able to get it to the lungs to be oxygenated before it gets to the extremities. That's the whole problem. Because shock ultimately really has to do with oxygen delivery. It, 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 it is defined by your parameters like blood pressure, but the blood pressure is really a, a, uh, a something that's telling you what is really happening with oxygenation in, in the, uh, you know, the end organs, the in organs that matter like your liver and your brain and your uh, things that need oxygen, your heart needs oxygen. So, um, neurogenic shock is down all, all across the board. So you don't really have to write that into the chart. You don't have to memorize that. If you look at septic shock, 
Um, it's pretty similar um, to neurogenic shock in that your systemic vascular resistance is going to go way down, right? Because what are you doing? You're, you're creating some kind of cytokine reaction that is um, causing you to have your vasculature, your, the muscle, muscular vasculature, the smooth muscle in your, in your, in your vessels to, um, to uh, dilate the vessel by, by relaxing and not contracting. And that's a response to histamine, or it's a response to um, other vascular signaling um, in the response to a to a uh, to a infection. And so it could be to an infection or to a to um, to a. Sometimes, for example, you could you could kill a, a bug, and it's just the floating around um, dead components of that uh, bacteria that. Um, that is causing uh, a reaction to your vasculature and causing you to be in a septic shock. Um, but the point of this diagram is that if you assume that everything's down, then you only have to write the up arrows. So I'm only going to write up for septic shock in the category of, cardi of, of cardiac output or cardiac index. I'm only going to write an up arrow what would be my up arrow for pulmonary capillary wedge pressure in cardiogenic shock? Why, why would I get that? Uh, because you're not pumping blood out of the heart, so you're getting fluid in the primary circulation. Exactly, exactly. That was, that was apelage? Am I saying that right? Uh, yep. All right, well, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. And I would, I would specifically say not the left ventricle, and so, because it's a left heart failure, it's what they call congestive heart failure. And so, if you have cardiogenic shock that is left heart failure, then, then you will expect that the blood that would otherwise have gotten out of the left ventricle will build up, and it will cause there to be regurgitation potentially or a failure to get blood out of the left atrium. And if you can't get blood out of the left atrium, you might as well pretend that this is a mitral stenosis. Uh, the end diastolic volume of the left ventricle is going to be enormous and it's going to be very hard to get blood through the mitral valve into the left ventricle. And so your pulmonary exactly right. Your pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is going to go up. Um, do you guys know what will be up in, um, in cardiogenic shock um, other than your pulmonary capillary wedge pressure? Sorry? Then you preload. Um, so your preload you're saying? Yes, exactly. So why is your preload raised? Because you are uh, pumping enough blood out. There's a low ejection fraction. Exactly. Exactly. And that's a great, that's a very uh, cardiologist way of putting it because that's what they pay attention to, the ejection fraction, which is your cardiac, I think it's your cardiac output um, minus your end diastolic volume, I could be wrong. Um, but yeah, so that, that's your ejection fraction, which is not, it's a dimensionless term that expresses the percentage of blood that you're getting out of your end diastolic volume, which is the blood that you have in your left ventricle before you contract your ventricle. And so your preload is going to be high because you're, well, that's the problem. You're not getting blood out of your heart to your extremities, right? So your, your preload is going to be high in um, cardiogenic shock. Do you know another type of shock? So that was, that was Bashan, I believe. Thank you for that, Bashan. Um, is, there, is, there, is there another type of shock that has increased central venous pressure or preload? So anaphylactic shock, um, anaphylactic shock would be what kind of shock? Would it be neurogenic or septic? Or hypovolemic? Or obstructive? Neurogenic shock? Neurogenic, yeah. So, so uh, it kind of falls within the distributive. Um, and um, so, it, it's kind of hard to, to characterize 
anaphylactic shock um, into septic, but I, th I think it most closely resembles septic shock. Um, and so you, you wouldn't call it neurogenic because the body is doing what it should do neurogenically. It's just that your, your, your autonomic nervous system is reacting appropriately to histamine and anaphylactic shocks. And so histamine is causing your IgE antibodies in your mast cells to uh, couple. And when they couple, they open and they pass histamine out of the mast cells and degranulate. They call it degranulation because the histamine is a granule of histamine and it is degranulating out of the cell. And that causes the vasculature to dilate. When the smooth muscle actually contracts, it, it dilates the, the vasculature. And so, um, and so that would be kind of like uh, most analogous to septic shock. And so you wouldn't, see, you wouldn't see central venous pressure increase in anaphylaxis because the problem with anaphylaxis is you are causing the blood to stay where it is all over your body. It's hard to get perfusion pressure because the caliber of the vasculature is increasing so much. And so you're not going to get blood back to your heart to pump out because it's staying in your like your diastolic, you know, blood, the blood that's that's trying to enter into your uh, right atrium is is kind of encumbered by the fact that it's not able to pump um, uh, or be sucked back into the right atrium. The truth is, it's like a suction. Uh, uh, it's good to think of the blood that's coming back into the right heart as being sucked into the right heart and the blood that's leaving the, the left ventricle is being pushed out of the left ventricle. And so that'll help you kind of approximate what the blood will be doing. Um, so when, you, when you're able to have the, you know how you have to learn those uh, pressure loop diagrams and you're supposed to understand the phases of like iso, isovolemic uh, relaxation is the stage before your vegetable fills with blood. The, the opening of the tricuspid valve that allows blood to come into the right ventricle is a suction force that brings blood out of the uh, veins and up a rung on the valve. That's why you have valves on, on your lower, on the veins in your lower limbs and, and your upper limbs that um, keep the blood where it is until your ventricle can relax again. And then it will suck blood up up into your into your uh, into your heart, and so in anaphylaxis we'll have too much dilation to get it into the central venous pressure. So there's one other where the central venous pressure will be raised. Do you guys know what that is? It'll be obstructive shock. Obstructive shock is caused by cardiac tamponade and pulmonary embolism. So obstructive shock, you always have you have. Raise central venous pressure because that's measured at the at the right atrium, and so you're that's that's if you remember the diagram where you have the lungs here, and you have the heart here. The problem is that you have a, a break, where the blood on this side is not being pumped very effectively, and the blood on this side is pumping against the pressure of that blood not getting through. And the reason during a pulmonary embolism is you have a clot right here that's blocking it, right? So you have a pulmonary artery, and you have like uh, you know, you have a clot, like keeping the pulmonary artery from efficiently getting blood through the pulmonary vasculature, the oxygenated blood back to the heart to be pumped out to the rest of the body. Right? This is a super crude diagram. So your, your central venous pressure is going to be increased because the blood is backing up, is, is like trying to get through here. You have pulmonary hypertension, so your pulmonary artery is being, is super uh, high pressure. And then it's going back into your right ventricle and then back into your right atrium. And uh, in cardiac tamponade, what you have is you have a pericardium. And then the pericardium is being full of fluid, potentially. This is one cause of cardiac tamponade. Where if you had a free wall rupture, you might have blood that was filling the pericardium. It's like a balloon full of fluid that's not compressible. So when you try to get blood into the right ventricle, and it tries to compress the blood. It doesn't, it's not, the muscle's not able to expand when it contracts to get the blood to move out of the right ventricle. And, um, and so it's not able to pump blood to the heart very effectively. It's not able to get blood out of the left ventricle very effectively. And that's why you have pulsus paradoxus, which I can explain if somebody asks me, I can explain it at the end of the lecture. Um, 
and that's a really nice uh, lecture there. But um, but the other one is cardiogenic shock, is, is obstructive shock because you get um, you get backed up blood pressure from the blood that's not able to get to the lungs. And the only other so so what we have here is we have four arrows to remember. Okay, because we wrote this diagram the way that we did, we only have four arrows to remember. We have we have to write in shock at the top, neurogenic, septic, hypovolemic, obstructive, and cardiogenic. And we have to write Pisco, like Pisco Sours. If you ever go to Ecuador, you should order one. They're delicious. Um, but get the non-alcoholic. No, I'm just kidding. You're all adults. And so you get Pisco, P-I-S-C-O. That's pulmonary capillary white pressure, cardiac index, systemic vascular resistance, uh, central venous pressure, and SpO2. You should understand these terms very deeply. Uh, these are going to come up in your test over and over and over again. This is the most probably the most high yield topic in all of step one. And you only have to remember four up arrows. So the, the only reason um, I have more to do is because the only assumed up arrow category is the systemic vascular resistance. There are more categories that say up. Hypovolemic shock, systemic vascular resistance is up because it's trying to get the blood back to your heart. Obstructive shock is doing the same thing. Cardiogenic shock is doing the same thing. They're worried that you're not getting enough blood to your heart, and so they are increasing the systemic vascular resistance by th through things like angiotensin II, through things like epinephrine and norepinephrine uh, in your adrenal glands, and so, and so uh, they're trying to increase the tone of your vasculature. So the only two that arrows that you need to draw that aren't up arrows are these two side-by-side -side down arrows. And you don't even have to draw a down arrow for neurogenic because I want you to remember that neurogenic shock is depressed. Neurogenic shock is the saddest of all shocks and it has down arrows for every category. Okay, so where do you get depressed? You get depressed in your brain. You get down arrows for all of neuro neurogenic shock. Okay, and so really the only down arrow that you need to draw other than these four up arrows is the septic shock down arrow because it's exceptional to systemic vascular resistance, which is all up. So you know that all of PISCO is down except for the S, and the S is the only exception to the up arrows in systemic vascular resistance. So I don't know how useful that is. It helps me remember in a pinch uh, where I am and what the kind of, just do a stupid check. You know, when you do math, you wanna make sure that you don't answer a question with uh, a number that's totally out outlandish. This is a good way to check your work and make sure you don't ever mess up a shock question ever again. So, so does that make sense to you guys? Do you guys have any questions about that? So uh, don't don't uh, don't um, if, if if you guys don't like this explanation, I, I won't do this lecture again. It's the first time I'm doing it. But uh, I just made kind of a diagram because I think writing Pisco and end shock and doing some up arrows for me is useful. But, uh, but um, you know, at two... For the CI, uh, the arrow up. For, for shock? For septic? Uh, I see the arrow up uh, for uh, TI, the cardiac index. Yeah, so, so cardiac index has one... I'll do a better color. Um, cardiogenic shock has one up arrow, and that's in septic shock. Okay, yeah, and so that up arrow is because in septic shock you actually get tachycardia, and what your heart is trying to do is make up for the fact that you're it's 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 not getting enough it's not getting enough blood um, to um, to um, to its uh, to the heart, and so it's it's it's, it's trying to get it's trying to get um, to pump uh, blood that it's really not getting, it's not receiving. Um, the pr the problem in septic shock is like it, it, in hypovolemic shock, you'd expect the cardiac index to go up, but the problem is you don't have enough fluid to get the cardiac index to go up through through increased heartbeats. In, in, in septic shock, you're increasing it because you have all these stress hormones like cortisol and things causing your heart to try to make up for the fact that it's under stress and it's, it has septic in, you know, problems. But in hypovolemic shock, um, 
you don't have enough fluid to have those Frank Starling mechanisms to increase your cardiac output. And so you're not able to, there, there's something, there's something very special about cardiac muscle where when you stretch it, it actually has increased contractility because the myosin and the um, myosin uh, light chains are, are, are matching uh, with one another at, for, at higher levels of uh, stretching and they actually contract more effectively. Um, and so in septic shock, you'll actually get um, a higher cardiac output, meaning more blood out of your end diastolic pressure. Whereas in hypovolemic shock, you don't have enough fluid to stretch your cardiac muscle and get that get that response. So that's a good question. Um, and so, thank you. Yeah, th thank you for thank you for asking. Uh, questions like that actually everyone has them, and if you ask a question, everyone benefits. So um, so th this is this is a uh, this is the only exception. It's the up arrow. So that's that's all we're going to talk about there for now. So this is the game. Can you guys see the screen here? I'll, I'll share. I'll share my screen. So this is the game, um, and uh, and so this is for Brigmai. I'm going to change the settings so that we have some we have some music, but not too much. I don't want to drown you guys out. And uh, and we'll get started. So, do you guys have a preference on what kind of character we play? Nobody ever says they do. Group C, uh, uh, we'll say step one. All right, and uh, let's be let's be a uh, assassin for now. I'll tell you what. Let's let's be let's be an archer for now. Okay, so first thing we do is we're gonna get some skills, so we can kick, um, so we can press U and upgrade, and we'll get one kick, and then we should get a ton of this because I think this does a ton of damage. So usually you wouldn't start with a bunch of skill points; you'd earn them throughout uh, killing enemies. But for the purposes of learning, we're gonna do that. The way that this works uh, is you have a series of action points here. And this green will be, uh, right now it's really crude and there's only four action points that we have available, but there'll be action points that you can spend on movement. So I'm about to move and you'll see the action points. I've clicked on a screen and I have three vision points, so I can only look around so many times before they start uh, closing their eyes. But I've clicked this tile now and I'm going to move towards this tile. So I've used two action points. I've bought more vision points and I've also moved one square. Um, if you look at my backpack, I have items here that I start with, and these are squares where I can't move to that are, are embankments next to uh, sources of water and things like that. And so in order to move more, we're going to have to answer questions and earn action points quickly, accurately, and with high confidence. And so, Rowenda, do we have anybody um, in the name generator we could ask the first question? Yeah. Uh, hi. Um, so, first, participant is Dr. Rafa. All right. Okay. All right, you ready? So, do you want to read it or should I? Well, I'll read it. Okay. All right, let's do it. Okay, so a 41-year-old woman presents to her primary care provider with skin lesion on the back of her neck. The lesion is not itchy or painful. She believes the lesion is new. Her past medical history is notable for generalized anxiety disorder for which she takes publicity. She has had uh, occasional diarrhea, increased fluctuations, and worsening fatigue over the past two years. She has had 10 pack year of smoking history and drinks three to four glasses of wine per day. Her temperature is uh, 37.2 degrees. Uh, blood pressure is 130 over 75, pulse is 90 per minute, beats per minute, and respirations are 18 beats per minute. Her BMI is 21. A notable skin finding is shown in figure A. And immunohistochemist uh, analysis... Sorry, um, I'll open that later, here. So, immunohistochemical analysis of lesion would most likely reveal elevated levels of which of the following, right? So I'll I'll pause it when we look at the chart so you have more time. So what? How how would you describe this? So this is an ulcer which is irregular. Yeah. The edges are irregular and it's elevated. 
Yeah. Is color anything? Yeah. So it's not macular, it's kind of like papular. And it might even, you might even think that it's like vesicular because it has some kind of like bulges to it, but I'm not sure if I would describe it as vesicular, but it, it definitely has erythema on the edges, right? Yes. And you're, you're doing, you're doing like a, you're doing an awesome job at like doing a systemic evaluation. So you're like, all the aspects that you should be paying attention to, you're, you're mentioning, like, um, you're mentioning that there's a regular border, it's elevated, it's discolored, certainly, right? Yes. Um, so it's it's very distinctively black. So do you, do you have any impression as to what this might be? It looks like malignant melanoma. Malignant, yeah. So what about it gives you the impression that it might be melanoma? Uh, because of the color, um, it looks Yeah. Yeah. So, so she doesn't have a temperature. She has some recent diarrhea and flatulence, right? And, um, and she has fatigue. Um, and so it's not itchy. It's just, it's not painful either. So that's another kind of, I think that's probably a good thing if you're trying to diagnose melanoma, that it would not be itchy or painful. Um, Usually in melanoma, you'll see something under the skin. You'll see kind of a, uh, you'll see white, red, or um, uh, you'll see kind of, usually white represents resolved, you know, and, and red represents kind of um, dilatation of blood vessels. And, um, and uh, kind of under the surface of the, of the skin will be some pigmentation. Um, the raised component of this gives me the impression that it, 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 it might be melanoma, it might not be. Um, but uh, do you, if you believe that it's melanoma, which answer choice do you think would correspond? I don't know. I, I would I, when I hear keratin, I hear like squamous, um, because squamous cells have keratin pearls, and there's there are, there are other types of cancers that'll have keratin. But um, you know, keratoacanthomas can have um, keratin. Um, uh, but um, in terms of cancer, I would go with I, I don't associate that word with squamous cell carcinoma though. So I'll be honest, I'm not sure. Um, so. So, um, what about chromogranin? How, what do you associate with that? I'm not sure of chromogranin. So, I associate chromogranin with, like, a specific layer of the, like, the tri-lipid, uh, the tri-layer uh, um, developmental, you know, the ectoderm, the endoderm, the mesoderm? Okay. And so, um, this is like the, this would be like a neurocrest derivative, um, suggestive of a neurocrest derivative, chromogranin, in my mind. That's how, that's how I think about it. We, we might, it might be like neuroendocrine is, is like chromogranin in, in my mind. I, I, I might be a little bit um, fuzzy on that, but I think that's right. Uh, car, car, carcinoembryogenic antigen, do you know? Tumor marker, so that's yeah. about. So if it was ovary, it, it might be, um, uh, uh, is it 9, 29? And then, um, uh, so there's a bunch, there's ovary, there's, there's, uh, I think, I, I think, yeah. Yeah, what is it? 19.9. Yeah. And then, and then what is the pancreas? Thank you. Yeah, also 19.9. Okay. And so, uh, and so these are different tumor markers that, um, and so then Desmond, what do you associate with Desmond? So we usually refer to this as CEA, C for carcino, E for embryonic, then antigen, right? So then Desmond, Desmond is, is usually like skin cells. And so these are just things that your cells release when they die which are associated with them. They're not perfect, but they, they, they can be detected when you have certain types of cancer. What, what do you think S100 represents? Uh, S100, no idea. So S100 
it represents uh, many cancers, but it would be it would be associated in, in some questions with melanoma. And so, um, so I'm going to give you some time. The timer's going, and the longer we take, the less action points we get. So I'm, I'm putting, I don't mean to put unreasonable amount of pressure on you, but it doesn't matter whether maybe you get it right. Uh, maybe we'll just go for D. Okay, we'll go for D. What confidence do you want to use? Uh, orange. All right, so orange. So chromogranin. So if you're right about melanoma. I think you're right about melanoma. Yeah. So this is likely to be melanoma. Let's see if they agree with us. Yeah, melanoma is malignant skin. So you were right on, right at the beginning. Uh, you just wanted to associate, this is a classic situation where someone knows the answer, they diagnose it correctly, they go to the answer choices and it looks like Greek, and they don't know which answer choice corresponds to the thing they know the answer is. Um, and so this is classic, like, memorization. S100, you don't have to know why, but it's neuroprest derivative tumors as well. Um, and it's also, um, so I was right that these are neuroendocrine, they're not neuroprest, this is, this is neuroprest. So one thing to keep in mind, and this is controversial amongst histologists, but step one seems to believe that mel mel melanocytes, which are the site cells which are caused, uh, that are become malignant in mel melanoma, are skin cells that are derived from neuroprest cells. And so uh, they're very strange cells because nothing else in your skin is neuroprest derived, just melanocytes. So they're very weird. Um, and they produce melanin, which causes your skin to become pigmented. And so, um, and so S100 will be found in neuroprest derived tumors. And so melanocytes are a specific cell in your skin that has neuroprest. Um, so when you're testing a skin cell and you have S100, it's very bizarre that it would have neuroprest uh, characteristics, and so it suggests that it's melanoma. Um, if this was, for example, a uh, uh, neuroganglioma, you'd have chromogranin, or a pheochromocytoma, they're saying, or medullary thyroid cancer. Um, and uh, CEA, we were talking about a few sources, like pancreatic, um, uh, breast, colorectal, they also have ovarian. Um, what did we say the ovarian was? What number? Uh, it's also 19.9. 19.9, okay. And so, um, I think, I think the, the pancreatic and the ovarian would be different numbers. No, pancreatic is actually... Yeah, they're actually the same. Oh, they are? I don't know about that. Okay. Are we sure? Okay. I, I believe you. I believe you, but uh, I, I didn't remember it that way. Um, Pancytokeratin pen, pen is a stain that detects various cytokeratins in epithelial cells to derive from epithelial cells such as salivary glands. So we're learning that together. That's not a particularly highly well-known fact, I would say. But uh, it's thyroid anaplastic carcinoma, salivary gland tumor, so sialidoco, you know, cancer. Uh, if, if, you get a, if you get a salivary gland tumor, usually they'll test it by asking you which cranial nerve is affected, which mus muscles. It's the bulbar muscles of your, of your face that will be affected because your facial nerve passes through your uh, parotid gland. And so if you have a salivary gland tumor in your parotid gland, you'll get a facial nerve palsy. And that's a, that's a very common question. And then Desmond, uh, like we said, uh, is mesenchymal tissue. Mesenchymal tissue will give rise to skin as well. Um, and also uh, uh, cartilage. And so it's an, it, it's an intermediate filament, which uh, you should learn the different types of filaments and what they, what they do, right? Um, uh, let me just correct you that uh, for over it's actually CA125. Ah, ah. Uh, okay, okay, that's what I was thinking because the way that I remember that is 19 has a 9 in it and it looks like a pancreas to me. Mm -hmm. And then, um, so that's, I, I like to, I like to get that, um, um, that mnemonic going. So, so we just answered a question. Thank you so much. That I think you were like, 99% there, and, and the S100 is something you're going to see over and over again now. Um, uh, so it's just a USMLE specific fact. Um, uh, Alright, so Rowenda, do we have the next uh, victim here? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, CAS, 
Sienna, uh, I recognize you again from... Yeah, yeah. All right. All right, let's do it. Do you, do you want to read this time? Yeah, yeah. All right, let's do it. Is that font large enough? We can scroll down. Okay, so it says, uh, a 66 years old man who went to the office complaining of abdominal pain. It was with a pain in the face in the morning. A person asked him for the first time to the table. The patient is giving the first position for hypertension, hypertension, and doubt. He takes aspirin with lisinical, celobustin, and aloprenol. He used ibuprofen during the acute cavity dancing to improve the sound of the dancing. He also started drinking in good heat once a week after his wife saw a new show in the book of Nicholas Pancho. The patient has a glass of whiskey after work the next week and denies uh, tobacco and excess alcohol. And after an endoscope was performed that uh, released a cancer cluster, uh, he gave breakfast as positive for a good spiral. The patient is prescribed this mix of delicate and liberal micro-nedible and it has been for two weeks. Follow up the patient continues to continue on the following pain. He has to deny the medication. Then 12 of intensive the day in his hands to make a medical connection here and Malena on the last year previous to this review was negative for medication. I repeat, breakfast is positive which is the following type of call of the poor treatment in this form. Right. So, all right. So, which of the following is most likely cause of this patient's poor treatment response? So, uh, all right. So, this is an extremely long question. Uh, thank you for reading that. Um, what are your What are your thoughts on some of the early descriptions of, like, in terms of diagnosis? Yeah. So, upper GI bleed and So if you, yeah, if you have Molina, you're getting that from, from the Molina? Mm -hmm. So, so Molina is what? It's kind of gross to explain. Yeah, it's, it's blood, right? Yeah. So you're, you're, you're actually defecating some foul smelling black blood that is, it's, it's deoxygenated it has iron from the heme, it turns black, and then it comes out of your rear end because you had an upper GI bleed, which is to say it's above the ligament of traits, and so it's above the two-thirds of your duodenum, so it's pretty high up there if you're getting black blood that's foul-smelling, so that suggests that it's an upper GI bleed. And so, what do you think the cause of that bleeding is? So what would H. pylori be a, a, a very common cause of? Um, I think H. pylori is the one that is most affecting the podiatrist uh, problem in the like, stomach. Could you, could you increase your uh, volume or... Um, I, I'm having trouble hearing you, sorry. Uh, sorry. Um, oh, so God. I'm saying that like, H. pylori is like the main bacteria that is affecting the stomach. So I think it is the one that is There, there's like three things that I associate with H. pylori. Um, one is a peptic ulcer. Peptic uh, is like uh, Greek for stomach. And so that would be a stomach ulcer. And then, um, and then the other uh, thing is a duodenal ulcer. And then another thing is gastric cancer. And so those three things, when I hear uh, H. pylori positive, my ears prick up because I've never had a question where they said I was H. pylori positive and they weren't talking about one of those three disorders or trying to get me to think that they have something like a duodenal ulcer um, and misleading me. So they're always saying duodenal ulcer, peptic ulcer, or gastric cancer when they're saying H. pylori, almost always. And, and the reason, so urease is actually something that H. pylori uses to survive in the acidic environment of your stomach and your, uh, and your duodenum by producing something that is alkaline, um, uh, converting um, urea 
to uh, I think ammonia, and then it causes a, a I think it causes a little like kind of uh, micro environment that is uh, alkaline. And but but for all intents and purposes for the exam, it's producing an alkaline environment, and so. It's, it, it's, it's the source of, of ulcers. Actually, the story behind how they figured that out is really interesting, and the guy who discovered it um, uh, took a shot glass full of H. pylori and gave himself a peptic ulcer. And so he was proving that the source of peptic ulcers was H. pylori, because people used to just, uh, they used to just cut the ulcer out and sew it up. And it used to be this ab abhorrently terrible process where, where people would get really um, a long uh, recovery time. So thank God they're treating this bacteria. Do you know what the treatment is for H. pylori? It's it's a triple treatment. It's like um, it's what they call the triple treatment. It, it has uh, PPIs and antibiotics such as um, amoxicillin and um, and uh, charcoal and um, and uh, do you guys know? Do you guys know the four? There's really four, but there's three. We, we'll, we'll see because they'll, they'll give us uh, that information in the answer choice. But the point is that I think they're talking about either a peptic ulcer or a stomach ulcer. So do you know, do you know the difference in clinically, kind of like when a patient comes in, the difference in what they'll describe between those two ulcers? I think like peptic ulcer, like the food we take, we So, so which one's worse directly after you eat? It's duodenal. Duodenal. Okay. Do you guys know? Gastric. Gastric's worse? Because you're, you're, when you, when, one of the ways to remember this is, when you eat, you expand the stomach. And when you expand the stomach, the stomach has cheap cells, which are going to release uh, hydrochloric acid. And your ulcer is exacerbated by acid. And so, because the problem with the ulcer is you have a partial uh, indentation in the lining of your mucosa in your stomach. And so, um, it's, it's the gastric ulcer is worse af directly after meals because you're expanding the stomach and you're releasing hydrochloric acid. And so, um, if you're taking an NSAID and um, and you have peptic ulcers, you, you're, you know, it's probably, probably hurting your uh, gastric mucosa because you have prostaglandins. But, um, so, um, so we're looking at these answer choices. We gotta choose one. What, what do you think, what do you think, uh, which, which, are there any answers you don't like? Allopurinol. Yeah, I don't like allopurinol either. That's like a gout drug and I don't think it affects your, uh, your stomach very much. Yeah, and also we can rule out ginkgo tea. Yeah, ginkgo tea. What do you think they're getting at with the ginkgo tea? Maybe something like or something before Yeah, I was thinking maybe because caffeine is known to cause gastric, uh, you know, gastric contraction as well. Um, do you guys know? No. Um, so. So what about alcohol use? Do you like that answer? No. I don't like that answer either. Um, ibuprofen? Mm -mm. I think C is the like broccoli one. Antiacid use. Antiacid use. All right. So what confidence do you have? It's the orange one. All right. So I'm not sure. I, I think I like E, but I'm but, so let's let's do the orange one and we'll we'll investigate. Okay, so antacid, so let's look. Okay, so we have, we're, we're clicking on the, uh, the, the highest one is actually this one we got right. So antacids can, can cause decreased absorption of antibiotics, such as tetracyclines. And so the point of this question is patients presenting with H. pylori induced peptic ulcer, which is the right diagnosis. So we got, we got that. So then, then including antibiotic tetracycline, quadruple therapy. So, so what is quadruple therapy? Do you guys know? Yes. Okay. So, what are they? Uh, it's it's a PPI. Yeah. Um, 
beat this much, because I think I'm a very good Yeah. So what you said two that I heard, and then you said two more. Um, I said PPI, bismuth, macronidazole, and tetracycline. Tetracycline, right? Okay. Um, and so let's see. Ginkgo, ginkgo is an herbal supplement that has risks of drug interactions, antiplatelets, coagulations. Um, so it it it's it's. I was thinking maybe it was a cytochrome P450 that I didn't know about. It's not. It's just. It's, it's not a really very high yield thing. I, I'm not sure that they're going to want you to know that on the test, but um, that's a really low yield fact. But, um, but the point here is that the goal of NATS is, is, is to increase gastric pH, which is to say make it more alkaline. So you have less H+, uh, which is to say less acid, so less hydrochloric acid uh, effects by increasing the pH. And so it can also alter the absorption of certain medications. So the point is that you're trying to use um, uh, antibiotic tetracycline for two weeks to cure it, cure your, uh, your, your situation. And the problem is your antacids are uh, interacting with your antibiotic and causing an inability to absorb uh, the drug. And so the drug delivery is encumbered. And so, um, um, so you, you probably shouldn't drink milk or dairy products or antacids. While you're while you're taking, you know, an antibiotics because you're you're going to a lot of antibiotics are affected by this. Um, another thing that might do this is if you took like uh, a meprazole, which is a PPI, you know. Um, and so um, that's a that's a really good question, and I think that's probably a difficult question as well. Um, I, I the the ibuprofen answer had to do with NSAIDs decreasing your mucosal lining. Um, and so, although you have pe peptic ulcer disease, um, it, this was really getting at the drug interaction and not getting rid of H. pylori, not getting rid of, uh, of the infection. All right, so I, I actually got that wrong. You got that right. So that's, that's a great job. Um, so uh, who, who's next, Rwenda? Should we... Rowan, are you there? Uh, yes, yeah, so, uh, hang on, sorry. No problem. Okay, so the next one is Bushan. Bushan, okay. Bushan, are you, are, are, do you want to read, or should I? Uh, do I have to read the entire thing about um, ideally, if you read it all, just for everybody, and then and then you can. Yeah, uh, okay, yeah, I'll I'll pause it too. Okay, let's do it. No, no, no pause. I'll leave it there. Okay. A eighty-year-old woman presents with uh, presents to the urgent care center complaining of weakness, confusion, and uh, heart rate is racing and puffing in her chest. She has no significant past medical history. She denies taking any previous. Uh, she denies any previous episode of anxiety or issue. Smokes half pack of cigarette per day and is a social drinker. Um, she denies the use of any illicit drugs. She has no known drug allergies. She does not take any uh, medications or deliveries. EKG is ordered and is shown in figure A. The patient's uh, vertebral contraction rate is determined by which of the following. Right. So let's take a look at the. Uh, yeah. yeah. So what are you thinking before we do the ECG? S B. That it's that it's AV node refractory period. Yes, I think so. So what what gives you that impression? Because AV node is the slowest um, of all, and fucking fibers are the fastest. So if something happened between the uh, ventricular contraction rate, it would be AV node a refractory period. So I would let me let me ask what you're saying because I think you're saying something right, but I think you're saying it in a way that it's it's hard to get at what so. Although the Purkinje fibers are the fastest in terms of conduction speed, are they the fastest in terms of how often they fire? Uh, I don't know. But I think uh, if AV mode isn't uh, sending a signal, Purkinje fibers won't get anything. So it all depends on AV mode. Like, uh, like in a reaction, how there is uh, a limiting reaction. 
Yeah, so, so Purkinje fibers are the largest and fastest uh, kind of fiber in your heart in terms of the speed at which uh, the conduction will travel. But the ventricular contraction rate will be determined by three things. The, the AV node, the SA node, and the HIS, bundle of HIS, right? And so, um, and so I think, uh, I'm trying to understand, how, how did you get to, to be AV node refractory period? Not that you're wrong. I just, you did it way faster than I could think about what the answer might be. So the way I think, think about it is like, and then the SA node sends a signal, and then it goes to the AV node, and then it, like, it follows the path. But if, um, if AV node is the slowest, um, but if, I mean, there won't be any ventricular contraction rate unless the slowest one works. Right. Right, so, 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 well, like, in, in order to get from the SA node to the ventricle, you have to have all of those connections intact. But if the bundle of HIS is firing, you're going to have really slow ventricular contraction rate, um, the, 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 like, uh, the frequency of the, of, the, of, the, of the contractions as opposed to the speed of the contractions. And then, but, but, um, but the, so, so we have weakness, confusion, racing and flopping in her chest, anxiety attacks, episodes of anxiety attacks and heart issues. She's a smoker, she's a drinker, and we look at the ECG and what do we see here? So what are you seeing? Uh, how, do you, how do you, what's your impression of this? Um. It's a pretty ugly ECG. Where our our images are going to be more in proportion to what they were originally when we get our our server going, and that'll be in a few weeks. Um, but what would you say this is? Is the QRS folder? Yeah, and it's really hard to determine what this is. I think it is the uh, TV. Yeah, it's probably a T wave, which would be a repolarization of the ventricle, because this is the depolarization yeah. of the ventricle. And yeah. you have two of these, which, I don't know, do you want to call that a P wave? I'm not sure. A U? A U wave? It, yeah, it might be a U wave, which would be in hyperkalemia. If, if you, uh, if yeah. you, you usually won't see U waves unless you have hyperkalemia. And you would have P T waves. And these are enormous QRS complexes, I'll mention, because that suggests that you have left ventricular hypertrophy, depending on what lead this is. Oh. Um, but this is an enormous T wave, I would say. Um, but another thing to mention is, is this regular? Is this a regular heart rate? No. Um, and so, how would you, what would you describe, this is a really hard one, I would say, but how would you describe this? It's okay if you don't know. It's an irregular, uh, irregular, irregular heartbeat. Um, I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure if there's an absence of P waves, so you're not sure whether it's... Because you really need an absence of P waves for it to be atrial fibrillation. So, yeah. um, it's hard to even get a PR interval because um, you don't know where the P waves start or end. So it, 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 it does look like your QRS is happening in a way that is um, uniform. It's not like you have, you have you, you don't have like VTAC. This is not VTAC, I don't think. Um, it, it could be VTAC if it's like, because without the SA node happening before this QRS complex, then you have a ventricular escape, ryth escape rhythm potentially. So it might be that you're getting escape rhythms from your ventricle and because I'm not even sure that you're tachycardic if you're so irregular so yeah it might be ventricular tachycardia you think or, or su super ventricular so super ventricular would be tachycardia that starts at the SA node and then uh, ventricular tachycardia would be anything below the bundle of his that goes into the Purkinje fibers and so, it would be, yeah. 
uh, only communicate the conversation. E at this visit. Right. So, um, what are we really asking? Um, like, how would you put this question in your own words? I don't really know. That's okay. That's okay. So this question is a bioethics question that really is getting down to whether or not you can, like, there's four pillars of bioethics. There's maleficence, beneficence, autonomy, and, uh, and, um, maleficence, beneficence, autonomy. Do you guys know what the fourth one is? I'm blanking on it. Do you guys know? What is it? Uh, mal something. Yeah, so that's maleficence. Then there's beneficence, which is like doing good. So do no harm is maleficence. Beneficence is like, you know, try to do best by your patient. Then autonomy has to do with allowing the patient to make their own decisions. Justice. And, and then there's justice, right? And that has to do with, thank you for that, by the way, um, is the distribution of, of medical care. So that's establishing, make, making sure that people receive uh, that if you go into hospital, someone else of a different denomination, age, creed, will receive the same level of care, and that it's fair. Um, and so, what category is this getting down to? Which pillar? This is about autonomy, I guess. Exactly. So, exactly right. So this is about whether or not she is able to give consent. Right? And so, the question of whether a patient can give consent is one of whether they are competent to give, to make decisions. And so you need to know in order to be, in order to be able to give consent, you need to have competence. So, so knowing that kind of how, how do you think about this question now? Do you know what a direct, do you, do you know what advanced directive planning is? Well, not really. That's that's see that's the thing they they reword things so that you don't understand what they're asking. So advanced directive is a living will. Mm, okay. Yeah. yeah. So you want to know whether or not she can decide that she's going to want to be innovated or she wants to receive antibiotics or she wants life saving procedure or she wants to go to palliative care. She can't unilaterally decide to go to palliative care, but you can't put her in palliative care if she doesn't want it. And you can't give her interventions that she doesn't want within reason. If she's competent, you can't give her, you know, life. You can't give her any treatments. And so, um, so, so knowing that, how how do you feel about these answer choices? What, what any? Are there any that you can rule out? Well, any. She is I ill. Speak. Out. Yeah. So that's definitely that's like square one. Just because you're sick doesn't mean you can't decide what happens to you. Only if her surgical and medical treatment fails, I will rule out that too. Right. Right. Because because we're not gonna subject her to anything she doesn't want. If if she doesn't if she's confident she can decide whether she wants to do it or not. Um so um I will go for the as the correct one. Right. Only if she initiates the conversation or at this visit, right? So at what point should her physician initiate a discussion? So I'm, I'm, I'm partial to E a little bit, but we'll see. So what confidence are you? Mm, yellow. Yellow, all right, let's try it. So it looks like they liked E. So one of the things they like to get you to do, and this is a classic question that they're gonna, you're, you're gonna be like, you're gonna be like, never get it wrong again, is if they're competent and they're dying of a, they're potentially dying of a disease, or even if they're not and they're just getting a little bit older, there's no harm in getting an advanced directive. If the patient is competent and they want to decide what will happen to them and they want a living will, there's no reason not to give them a living will. So they really I like... Have a yeah. Do I, as a physician, have the right to ask like mention it to someone who's not thinking about it? Yeah. Because, because it's never too early to get a living will. Like, okay. it's, it's not, you won't be pressuring the patient to get a living will by mentioning it or asking if they would like to have one. 
because uh, there's no harm in saying no and there's no harm in getting a living will because we're just what we're doing effectively is we're just asking you what do you want to happen what 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 if you came in here and you were incapacitated would you want to be you know revived resuscitated would you like to be you know if we had to remove a limb would you would you want a limb removed or would you donate your organs if you die you know um, some people are Mormon they don't like to get drug trans uh, uh, born um, they're uh, not Mormon, but they're, um, um, they don't, they don't want to have, uh, blood transfusions. So, um, and then there's, there's some patients who, um, have a religious, you know, uh, um, predilection towards not getting, um, uh, blood transfusions. And so, um, uh, I'll, I'll think of that denomination, re re religious denomination that doesn't want blood transfusions. If, if nobody knows it, do you guys know which uh, denomination doesn't want blood transfusions? Jehovah's Witness. Sorry? Uh, Jehovah's Witness. Exactly. Jehovah's Witness. That's right. Um, I actually uh, was in Australia and they had uh, patients who only wanted Aboriginal doctors and if there was a non-Aboriginal doctor, they wouldn't want life-saving procedures. Um, and so... Um, uh, advanced directive living will is a protective for do not resuscitate donor registry enrollment form and health health care power of attorney so if you were to hand over your power of attorney to someone they could decide what procedures you would receive if in in the case that you were uh incapacitated and you can designate that while you're competent but not when you're not competent so it's really asking about competence and this patient we have every reason to believe they're competent and they have a uh pancreatic cancer so it's a good time to talk about it um all right, so thank you. That, that's a confusing one because it's not obvious until you've seen it. You just have to see that question. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> There's no figuring that out. But um, so, Sam, are you back? Yes. All right, let's do it. Do, would you like to read? Yes. All right, let's do it. Yeah. So, um, 
What do we know about, so it says the swab of the pharynx both yield viral RNA. Is polio a RNA virus? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Uh, not analog. Uh, single stranded RNA. Uh... So this is one of those memorization things, and um, if you suspect polio, let's choose an answer and we'll read about it. And then uh, maybe next time I'll do an RNA DNA structure memorization tool that I've created. Uh, for my step one, I just wanted to memorize it and I had a really good way to, at least for me, to visually remember, quickly remember the structures. But I also remember using Sketchy Micro. Which, uh, which is a tool where they draw things out for you. A lot of American students use Sketchy Micro and really like it. Um, are you familiar with Sketchy Micro? Uh, yes. Oh, okay, all right, yeah. I really like that, but um, so which answer would you choose? I'm gonna turn the timer on. Okay. So I'll go with B. All right, which, which confidence do we wanna go with? Orange. All right, let's do it. All right, you got it. All right, let's see if the diagnosis was right. So we just we're keep getting hit by the snake, so we got to kill the snake soon. Um, RNA virus. So this is enterovirus, which is a rhinovirus, right? Um, so icosahedral RNA virus. Poliovirus is a member of the picornoviruses, right? So uh, I said rhino, but I meant picorno, because rhino is a picornovirus. Um, but it's a linear RNA. So rhinovirus, coxiella, polio are all um, icosahedral RNA viruses, if I'm not mistaken, right? Um, and they're saying that it's an unvaccinated immigrant, potentially, if you're coming from some of these countries, you might have a higher risk than the average American who is vaccinated by law in, in certain areas. And so um, polio, myelitis, they, don't, they can't check for every vaccination when people come in. And so it's possible that it's a risk factor. So they like to mention things like that when they're giving a polio question. They're going to mention things like that you're from a different, you know, part of the world, you know. Um, so if we look at this chart, this will tell you that the non-enveloped icosahedrals are the picornaviruses and the calici viridae, which would have rotavirus as one of the examples, which causes a kind of traveler's diarrhea as a viral cause. Uh, e. coli would cause a bacterial version of that. Uh, not a version of it, but just, you know, traveler's diarrhea is caused by many things, and Khaleesi virus is one of them. You can also get it in, in also young children get it in, in kind of nursery settings when they're around a bunch of other kids in daycare. Um, and so the coronaviruses constitute like rhinovirus, which causes rhinosinusitis, and uh, coxiella A and B, which cause, um, A causes hand, foot, and mouth disease, and B causes a pericarditis. Um, and then, um, poliovirus, which uh, causes polio, and that is a peripheral neuropathy. Uh, so that was a great job, man. Um, echovirus is a very low yield virus, but you still need to know what group it's in. Um, and uh, and enteroviruses, uh, these, these, many of these cause diarrhea, and they're spread through fecal oral transmission. This is all really high yield, really, really worth knowing information. Um, and these, this is just talking about what they lead to in terms of pathologies. Uh, you can go to the video and take a picture of this a little later. Um, so let's kill these guys because they're, 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 they're hurting us. Um, so let's shoot this snake. Hopefully we'll kill it. Oh, he has one hit point left. All right, so thank you so much, um, Sam, for that as well. Um, so um, I'm just going to call people out. Uh, Dr. Basis Ra? Yes. Have we done a question yet? Uh, yeah, I did one. I okay. Sorry, sorry. That's right. That's right. Uh, I'll actually, I'll get, I'll get someone else real quick just to get, get, make sure that everybody gets a turn here. Um, Helen. Helen, are you here? Yes. Yes, I'm here. Oh, great. All right. Are you uh, prepared to read one? No. I oh. just joined. I'm in here. Okay, well, 
we'll we'll try to answer, and if we don't get it right, we'll we'll open it up to the group, and we'll we'll do it that way. How's that sound? Oh uh, yeah. All right. So if you want to read it, I can I can read it, or you can read it. Either way. Okay, I can read it. All right. Let's do it. So. Yeah, a thirty-year-old female with HDF epilepsy becomes uh, pregnant. Her uh, epilepsy has been well controlled by taking a medication that increases the sodium channel in inhibition. Her obstetrician informs her that her epilepsy medication has been shown to have a therapeutic effect. One of the following, which therapeutic effect is this woman's medication most likely to cause? Yeah. So this is asking like, what anti-epileptic is teratogenic? Do you know what teratogenic is? Mm, yeah. So what is teratogenic? Uh, cause the uh, during pregnancy, cause cause the defects. Yeah. During, yeah, cause defects. Yeah. So yes. Uh, so problems with the fetus. Yeah, problems with the fetus. Yeah. So. So what drug is a sodium channel activation drug in terms of its mechanism that's anti-epileptic? I think Valproid. Um, I think it could, it could, Valproid I think might work through calcium. I could be wrong, but I think, I think it could also be phen phenytoin. Phenytoin, yeah, phenytoin. Yeah. 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 So it's got epstein in a way? Valproate might be the answer. Uh, I, I, I'd be surprised if they gave Valproate or Phenytoin to a pregnant woman, so they probably should never do that. But um, what, what adverse effects would, would Phenytoin maybe cause the fetus? So, so it's, it's true. Yeah, Epstein's anomaly has more to do with like if you took lithium. So like Epstein's anomaly is like atrialization of the ventricle, um, and so it, it's it's just really short. It's like a short ventricle, and it, it, you see it a lot in toxicity with lithium. And then you have limb defects, which many things can cause limb defects. Um, you could have you know diabetes you know, in early, the first trimester can cause limb defects. Um, beckman Weidman causes limb defects. There's all sorts of things that cause limb defects. Um, neural tube, tube defects, do you know what those are mediated, usually mediated by? Uh, it's uh, deficiency of the folic acid. Yeah, exactly. Um, so that's why you take your prenatal vitamins and your folate especially. Um, yeah. And then uh, renal damage. What about what? What could cause renal damage? Uh, renal damage. I, uh, gentamicin can cause. Yeah, damage. yeah. Gentamicin is a great example, and and um, and then and then also NSAIDs um, yeah. will decrease your prostaglandin and decrease your dilation of the uh, afferent uh, afferent. Uh, of vessels to your to your kidney, and um, they will uh, decrease GFR and, and cause renal damage. Um, so, um, and then discolored teeth. Do you know what they're referring to with that? So that that's referring to tetracycline, or or any of the any of the uh, um, kind of doxycycline, any of the cyclines. They they cause they're they're like young kids. You don't give them tetracycline because it'll it'll. Uh, there's two reasons. Um, it'll you know teeth uh, deformities is a common problem, and then it, you can also have uh, if if they get sun that it actually optically active and causes inflammation if you get in the sun after taking tetracyclines. So that's what they're getting at with these answer choices. So do you know what which defect phenytoin phen might be associated with or even actually Valproate, I think. What are we thinking about? So this is just one of those uh, situations where you, so I'll have you guess and then, and then, and then I'll, I'll kind of tell you the answer. 
Because I because one of the things we want to do is get good at answering questions we don't know the answer to. Because you're gonna have questions you don't know the answer to. So if you could rule something out, like this was list, would she take lithium for epilepsy? Probably not. Yeah. Yeah, so I don't think so. So she would take that for bipolar usually. So you could rule that out. She's probably not diabetic, you know, because they didn't mention it. Um, renal damage, they didn't mention any of the NSAIDs that we were talking about or what you said, the, the amino glycoside. Um, um, and then tetracycline, we have no reason to believe that there's tetracycline. So I'm between A and C. Wh which one are you thinking you'd just guess? C. C? Okay. What confidence are we thinking? Yellow. Yellow, yeah. All right, we got it. So I want to thank you for doing that because I know it's it's like it's obnoxious to I'm asking you questions. You're like I already I I told you I don't know you know I'm early in my studies, but um, but your willingness to do that suggests that you're going to do really well because because it's like it's questions like those where you just like you bear through it and you try to try to learn like um, something new that like there's just there's lots of that you're right about valproate as well. So valproate has the same effect. I just I would not give valproate to a pregnant person ever. So it's such a weird thing that they would do it on it. But um, but phenytoin and valproate have the same effect of causing neural tube defects. And so you can have um, an increase in, in GABA concentration, so the sodium channel inactivation is um, is uh, is not what passes through the GABA because it's chloride chloride who, that passes through the GABA channels, but um, um, it's a sodium channel inactivator basically that you use for migraine prophylaxis for bipolar as well and epilepsy. So it's it's first line, but not for pregnant women. So that was great. Um, thank you for thank you for answering that question. Um, um, so I'll show you this. This is a neuro two defect, and if it was spina bifida occulta, you you might even have um, a tuft of hair here. But because this is actually um, a protrusion, uh, it's more like it's more like just spina bifida open defect. Um, so we're getting we're getting walloped here by this uh, by these two uh, snakes. So I'm going to use some of the points we just got from uh, Helen earned us uh, some some combat points. So I'm going to kick this guy, and I'm going to shoot him with an arrow. Oh, I ran out of action points. Here we go. I'm going to I'm going to use them, and I'm going to shoot this guy. Now we have the appropriate amount. Okay. So now we've killed one snake. We got to kill this other one. Uh, this spider. Okay, so, um, so Maria, have you answered a question yet? Yes, she's already done. Ah, okay. Um, we have a uh, call, Abilash. Abilash, all right, I was thinking. Abilash, are you here? Uh, yeah, I'm here. All right, let's do it. Uh, are you, would you like to read? Uh, sure, I don't see any questions. So. Okay, I'll bring it up here. So, a 61-year-old? Uh, I don't see it yet. Ah, I'll pause it so you Yeah, no, I see it, okay. okay. A 61-year-old Caucasian male presents to your office with chest pain. He states that he's worried about his heart as his father died at the age of 62 from a heart attack. He reports that his chest pain worsens with large meals and spicy food. There's spicy foods and uh, groups with calcium carbonate. He denies dyspnea on exertion and the ECG is normal. What is the most likely cause of uh, this patient's pain? Right. So what are you thinking about? So this kind of uh, sounds like he has a heartburn or reflux uh, disease. Uh, yeah. Answering this ECG is normal. Uh, and it seems uh, more like a pedagogic pain. So why is he taking calcium carbonate? Yeah. Uh, as an anti-acid uh, medication. Yeah. 
So which answer choice are you like? I think, I think you're thinking very clearly about that. <laughs> which are you thinking? Um, well, it's probably not D for sure. Great, you're ruling things out. C for sure. Um, and you said that there's like, no carcinoma that would be associated with some sort of weight loss or uh, difficulty swallowing. Great. Uh, so I don't feel that's it. So it's going to be between uh, A and uh, E. Uh, and amongst those two intestinal metaplasia, that would be associated with the uh, Barrett C. Davis. Right. Yeah. Well, I think I feel it's more likely to be A where he's having reflux of the uh, uh, stomach acids that's causing his symptoms. So which which answer would you go for? I would go for A. A. All right. Which confidence would you, you want to choose? Uh, I would say either orange or green. All right. I'm going to go with green because you seem like you're really... You got that one. You, you hit that one on, on the head. That was like a perfect explanation, I would say. Um, so so you, you destroyed these answer choices. Umbilical hernia is the only one we didn't talk about because it's kind of a weird one. Like uh, umbilical hernia is when, you're, when you have like some intestine that's poking out of your umbilical uh, orifice. And that's like a T10 that's way lower on your abdomen. Um, and it wouldn't cause you know, chest pain very conventionally. It can have referred pain but is really not an association with chest pain that I, that I think about. Um, so that's great. That's, that's a really good answer. Um, so GERD is associated with Barrett's esophagus, so you could have metaplasia of your gastroesophageal junction, but then you're talking about Barrett's esophagus if you're talking about, you know, you, you don't really get that much chest pain from Barrett's. You get the chest pain from your junction incompetence because that's, that's really the pain from the, from the gastric... Uh, acid coming up into your esophageal, you know, the squamocolumnar junction um, in your lower third of your esophagus. Um, so that was great. That, that has to do with the incompetence of your uh, lower esophageal sphincter. Um, so thank you so much. That was, that was great, Abilash. Um, so I think we've gotten to everybody. Is that right? Yes. All right. So now, Rowenda, you can tell us some random Yeah. Sam Jake. Alright, Sam Jake. Should we let's kick this guy. And we'll shoot him. Alright, Sam Jay, are you here? Yes. Alright, let's do it. Oh, this is the same uh is this the same? No, this is a different one. No, this is the same one, right? Yeah. So I'll just answer this real quick, and then we'll, we'll give you a question that we... It, it gives us questions again when we get them wrong, so we can see them again and, and uh, make sure that we get them right eventually. So I could pick up some items, but I'm just going to move on to the next. So this is our new art for the stage completion. We got six out of eight right. We've killed two monsters, completed the stage, so now I'm going to click next stage. And now we have to explore a new area. And uh, we're going to fix this bug where we still see the, the spider. After in the oh okay so now we're really privileged because we can shoot this across the uh, embankment and it can't attack us I don't think. Um, all right so Sam are you ready? Yes. All right let's do it. Eleven year old girl is brought to the pediatrician by her parents due to developmental concerns. The patient developed normally throughout childhood but she has not had menstruated and has noticed that her voice is getting deeper. Patient has no other uh, health issues. On exam, her temperature is 98.6, blood pressure is 110 by 68, her pulse is 74, respirations are 12 per, per minute. The patient noted to have a uh, tanner stage 1 breast and tanner stage 2 pubic hair. Pelvic exam, the patient noted to have a blind vagina and slight glycomegaly as well as two palpable testes throughout, uh, sorry, to the laboratory uh, worker. The patient is found to have five alpha reductase deficiency, which was formed. Uh, anatomic structures are correctly matched uh, homologues between male and female genitalia. So, uh, she clearly has a 5 alpha reductase deficiency, right. um, which shows that uh, she developed uh, certain male characteristics.
for yeah. the, like ambiguous genitalia, for, like can, for example. Yeah. So. Uh, can I can I ask you which of these is um, I I guess I I guess I'm not sure how to ask this, so I'm just gonna say it. Clitoromegaly is like is not just virilize it's like virilization. So in addition to being in addition to being masculinized as a as an you know potentially she's an X XX uh, chromosomed person, she has she has um, clitoromegaly, which is a virilization type type that is particularly um, suggestive of five alpha reductase. So I just wanted to point that out because it's a really in, it, you have to get a really high levels of testosterone or, or uh, DHEA to um, experience clitoromegaly as a female. Um, can I ask something? Yeah. Uh, so I read in the uh, in first year that the enzyme deficiencies that end in one, uh, they have a utilization, but I don't know what it means. Yeah, so you've asked a fabulous question. So let me, let me just show you what that means. So... Uh, let's put, let's put, let's put virilization or like masculinization over here. I think it's over here. And then let's put hypertension over here. Can you see this? Yes. So if I was going to go over here, I'd have high blood pressure. And if I was going to go over here, I'd have virilization and masculinization. So if I write the number 21, uh, alpha reductase, I'm going to write the whole thing so people know what I mean. Alpha reductase deficiency. Then the mnemonic that this person made was that every time you see a one, you have an up arrow. And so if you drew a column between these two things, you don't have an up arrow here, but you do have an up arrow here. So are you going to have high blood pressure with 21 alpha reductase? No. No. It's just a stupid, it's a stupid mnemonic. I say stupid in the most, in the fondest of ways because this is a really nice mnemonic. So what are some other numbers that you might have for reductase? 17 and 11. So 17. So are you going to have high blood pressure in, in 17 alpha reductase? Yes. You are, right? Why? Um, the one is on the left side. Exactly, the ones on the left side. So that's exactly right, and that's what you see. So you see lots of virilization in 21 alpha reductase, and the only caveat is that 5 alpha reductase, you also see lots of virilization as well. So 5 alpha reductase, 5 alpha reductase doesn't follow this pattern, but 21 and 17 do. All of the ones with numbers that have ones in them signal what what they're going to have. So like 11, what is it going to have? Both of them. It's going to have high blood pressure and you're going to have, in the female population, you're going to have clitoromegaly, potentially. You're going to have virilization for sure. And you're going to have high, high blood pressure. Because you have, in your adrenal glands, these are, these, are, these are in your adrenal glands, you have ACTH is coming in, then you have GFR, and this is a different GFR. This is layers of your, uh, this is like, um, th this is a glomerular, glomerular la layer of your, of your, uh, of your, of your adrenal cortex. Below this would produce uh, epinephrine and norepinephrine. But above that, in the, outside the medulla, this is the medulla, um, you have your cortices, which there's three layers, right? And different, these different, these different enzymes are causing it to go down or across these layers in the diagram on your first aid. You should probably check out first aid and see this, but, but, um, and there's many diagrams on Kaplan as well, but, but the idea is that virilization happens over here in the reticular area. And then there are, there is aldosterone like, uh, molecules that are produced. Um, um, and, and so your aldosterone-like molecules are what's caused, causing your blood pressure to spike. Um, and so, something, yeah. Something that I figured out is uh, you don't really have to think about potassium levels. You just, uh, they just oppose it to what your blood pressure would be. 
So if there's a high pressure, then there would be no potential there. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, you, 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 shouldn't, uh, you shouldn't go by that because your body regulates the electrolytes like potassium really closely. And so even though you have, even though you have a RAS system like situation going on where you're getting aldosterone and you're retaining sodium and getting rid of potassium, you're, you're not necessarily going to see an alkalosis or you're not necessarily going to see a potassium loss, um, but you will see high blood pressure. I was, I was just talking about the uh, enzyme deficiency. So in, yeah. in an enzyme deficiency, if there is a, um, a rise in blood pressure, there will be a fall in potassium levels. Yeah, yeah, there can be. Yeah, it, but, uh, but it's good to pay attention. To, I, I'd say pay attention to blood pressure and pay attention to these tanner stages. And uh, blind vaginal pouch is very specific um, as well. Um, so so um, which, which of these structures, it's asking, is um, correctly matched homologue between male and female. So let's 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 go let's go to A and just talk about A. Is the corpus cavernosum the labia minora in a female? The corpus cavernosum is a place where blood is is in in, in the penis is 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 filled with blood, and so. It's not an analog to the labia majora, minora. So uh, the corpus spongiosum and the clitoral crura. This is a difficult one. The, the corpus spongiosum is the is the is like part of it's like a structural support of the penis. So um, the crura. Is, is not in a similar location. I, I, I would be surprised if those were analogs on, ontogenically, which is to say developmentally. The corpus spongiosum and the greater vestibular glands, um, and then the bulbo-urethral glands and the urethral para-urethral glands. And then you have the scrotum and the labia majora. I think it might be E, but I don't know. I think the scrotum and the labia majora are analogs of one another developmentally between men and females. Uh, because they're exterior and they're superficial. And they're, 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 they don't have um, spermatogenic or ovariogenic uh, capacities. They're not tubular. So they have a lot of shared characteristics functionally. And locationally, anatomically, but what are, what are you thinking? I think E. E. Okay. I'm what thinking. what confidence do you want to go with? We might get this wrong, but. Oh uh, yes, orange. Orange. All right, let's do it. All right, we got it. Okay, so um, the scrotum and the labia majora. Do you guys know what the labia majora is? It's it's the outside kind of skin, uh, skin and superficial tissue of the vagina. So, um, so, and the scrotum is kind of the outside superficial skin tissue of the testes, um, so the testicles. Um, so we got some points here so we can explore a little bit. We, we got our first, uh, we got, the spider's trying to go come around and kill us, but uh, we're gonna push this, uh, oh, it looks like maybe the spider's dead. I don't know, maybe he retained an item. Um, all right, so we got to kill the goblin now. Thank you so much. Um, um, so I guess we'll move on to uh, Rwanda. Are you there? Yes. Um, let's go back to Dr. Rafa. Rafa. Okay. Yeah. All right, let's do it. Um, all right, let's try try a question here. So.
chest and scleral interus. His abdomen is distended and soft and non tender. His liver edges are pul palpable below 8 cm below the postal margin. Lab values are shown as below. So, what do we see here? So, let's talk a little bit before we look at that. What are, what are we thinking about in his presentation here? Uh, sounds like a patient with liver cirrhosis. Yeah. Right? Uh, yeah. Just probably maybe alcohol associated. Yeah, associated to alcohol, since it specifically says that he drinks one pint of vodka every Yeah. <laughs> That's slightly above normal. Yeah. Um, so, you're recommended to have like at most one drink a week, and he's drinking uh, a pint of vodka a day. So. That the equivalent of that is like, you know, enormous numbers of beers a day. So, why do you get telangiectasias if you have, you know, something like uh, liver cirrhosis? Uh, sorry? So why, why would you get telangiectasias? I'm asking you hard questions because I know... Because of the dilated, uh, venous, these poor venous return, dilated vessels. Yes, yeah, exactly. And so why do you get uh, these dilated vessels? from the cirrhosis? Uh, I think the, is it that the oncotic pressure uh, reduces? Okay, I'm not very sure. So you do have hypoalbuminemia when you have late stage liver failure. And, um, and so if you have less albumin in your blood, it's the most, it's the most uh, densely uh, constituent of serum of blood and so you uh, in terms of proteins and so albumin is is by far the most uh, highest proportion of protein in your blood and so um, when you're not producing albumin which the liver produces albumin you get hypoalbuminemia which causes you to have oncotic pressure into um, into um, the higher concentrations which will be outside of your vasculature. So one of the things that albumin does is it keeps the oncotic pressure moving fluid out of the blood and into the vasculature so you can deliver um, you know, fluid and inflammation and, and oxygen to your tissue. But if you have hypoalbuminemia, then you might third space the fluid into, uh, you know, out, out of your vasculature. But that's not what causes telangiectasia. So telangiectasia is to do with one of the things, the main thing that metabolizes estrogen is your liver mm -hmm. and, and so you'll actually get a dilatation just like you said uh, uh, telangiectasias are dilatations they call them spider nevi um, and that's that's to do with es hyperestrogenemia um, from your inability to get rid of it in the liver and, and urinate you know the urine uh, to defecate the urine eventually uh, uh, the estrogen eventually and um, and uh, so that hyper that hyperestrogenemia accounts for telangiectasia, the spider nevi, your pulmonary erythema, your uh, potentially you might get um, uh, you might even get uh, um, uh, you know male breasts breasts in, in a male, um, and so um, and so um, that's that's something to think about in terms of liver failure. So. If this was, um, uh, if this was um, liver failure, then I'm sorry, I'm just reading a message here. Um, let's let's look at this uh, this image and see see what we think about that. That's okay. Um, so I think what I see most is I see some fibrosis. Um, so there's different stages of liver um, failure, um, and there's different colors you would expect the liver to be. Just like pneumonia, you should you should go in. Just like there's three places where you really want to know the histology at different phases. So after an MI, you want to know what the cardiac muscle is going to look like. Uh, in liver failure, you want to know what the histology of the liver is going to look like. And um, you want to know in pneumonia, if the different phases of pneumonia. 
um, what um, what the uh, histology is going to look like. So those those are places where the histology is like you'll see them all the time. You just keep getting questions wrong if you don't just go into it and just like learn as much as you can about those three things is my suggestion. And one good place to do that is Pathoma. I think that's a, that's like the best resource for that. Um, so especially since Kaplan just bought uh, Boards and Beyond, I believe. Um, uh, so I, I would say that uh, Pathoma is an excellent resource. Um, so let's look at some labs here, because we read this stuff. Did we read the labs yet? Uh, no, we didn't. Okay. So sodium is normal because the normal is 135 to 41, 45. Right. Chloride is 90 to 110, that's normal also. Uh, potassium is also normal as 3.5 to 5.5. Great. Uh, carbonate is supposed to be, is it 16 to 24? Be yeah, answer. yeah. Twenty twenty two is the right on right on normal. Yeah. Um, and urea nitrogen. I'm not sure what the normal is. Uh, it. You want to look at urea nitrogen. Nitrogen. Very rare instances outside of AKI. So I would look at creatinine, and if it's not elevated, not worry about urea nitrogen too much. You won't even get gout if urea nitrogen is very high. Um, you can get uremic, uh, you can get uremic pericarditis and things like that, but if it's not a really high number for your conventions, just we're going to add lab results here, and you'll be able to check, um, and it'll be in the same format as UWorld and, and the real test. But um, that's normal. That's a normal uh, urea nitrogen. Um, so what do you think about the liver liver enzymes? Uh, the liver enzymes, ALT is okay, the normal, AST is also okay. Yeah, maybe a little elevated AST. And, a little elevated. And, and alcohol phosphatase is also normal. Yeah, yeah. And so, I would say that um, this is also one thing to notice. Do you notice the ratio between these? Uh, three, is it, uh, is it seven times more? So 97 and 59, it's like approximately two times. And so that corresponds, that ratio corresponds to a certain type of liver damage. Do you know what that is? Oh, no. So uh, usually alcoholic liver damage. So AST will get affected twice as, you know, twice as much AST will be released as, as uh, will be uh, active as ALT uh, upon testing. And then gamma glutamyl transferase, uh, do you know what that corresponds to? What structure? Uh, I think it's, is it OPS? Uh, I'm not sure, but did it it's, 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 it can be in the liver parenchyma, but it's also in the, uh, like the uh, biliary tree. Uh, yeah, obstructive jaundice, like usually in obstructive jaundice, uh, central yeah. jaundice, uh, it increases. And, and is this normal bilirubin? Yeah, this is normal. Uh, we're, we're a little bit higher. I think, I think one is about as high as you want to go. So, so this is a little bit, we're, we're not jaundiced yet because we're not experiencing yellow skin, but oh, we... Yeah, up to 1.2 weeks the normal, so it's a bit actually high, yes. Yeah, yeah. And so, and so this is a tricky question. Don't, don't get me wrong, but um, so what, what are, what are we looking at? Uh, which of the following cells mediate the process demonstrated in, in figure A? So if I told you that there was a lot of fibrosis, which of these cells would you think? Is it hepatocytes? I, I think hepatocytes are like the liver parenchyma. Do you know what I mean by parenchyma? The function of cells. Exactly. So what is the parenchyma of the, of the kidney? It's the whole, it's the glomeruli and the whole loop. It's the whole glomerul, gl all the glomeruli. The parenchyma of the lung is the alveoli. The parenchyma of the liver is the hepatocyte. It's the smallest unit of function. It's like the smallest unit of function that you have, you know, it's not a cell necessarily, it is in the liver, but it's the smallest like thing that you could say would still be, if you only had one glomerulus in the kidney, you'd still have a kidney technically, you know? 
But if you had no glomeruli, you would not have the function of the kidney. If you had no alveoli in the lung, you'd have no function for, for, for respiration in, 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 the, in the lung. And so the alveoli is kind of the parenchyma of the, of the, of the lung. So the hepatocyte is a parenchymal cell. It, it's, it's, it's the smallest unit of functionality in the liver. And so the thing that produces fibrosis, I hope I'm not steering you wrong. I hope I'm not getting this question wrong. But I don't think that the hepatocytes produce fiber. But, but what do you guys do you guys have an impression as to what this answer is? It's a very difficult question, pretty much. Difficult. It is. It is. This is but this question is the sort of question where it's super difficult and then if you take a bunch of NBMEs, you'll see it. And so they like questions like this a lot because it's at the end of your studying that you will learn this sort of stuff. So I would just prioritize it early, get it done, because this, this will eventually, believe it or not, even though it's not very clinical, it's something that they like to talk about on step one. And so um, I believe this is the stellate cell, but I could be wrong. But uh, uh, why don't we choose hepatocytes and maybe a low confidence and we'll take a look at it. Do you mind if we do that? All right, let's, 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 let's see what they say. I, I think it's a stellate cell, but I could be wrong. Yeah, so it's stellate cells. And so um, if you look at this here, they're showing, they're, they're circling that. Let's see what they say about it. So this is cirrhosis, just exactly like you said. It's chronic damage to the liver. You're right about the dilatation and the telangiectasia. There's a certain word that refers to dilatation and the telangiectasia that you should learn. And I'm trying to produce it from memory, and I'm having trouble remembering that word. If you guys want to tell me what that is, um, I would be very grateful. But because um, they like to trick you and say, "What is the dilatation and telangiectasia called?" Basically, is the question. But um, they're saying a liver biopsy with trichome stain, which is always the the the, the stain that they use for you know fiber, fibrous is fibrotic bands. So uh, these are regenerative nodules from damage from usually from alcoholic liver disease, but can happen in cirrhosis for other reasons. So hepatocytes are the main parenchymal tissue, they're saying. Langerhans cells are macrophages. And so that would have to do with like, you know, uh, immune response. Um, Langerhan histiocytosis, you have those tennis racket um, uh, cells on histology, panic cells. Um, are cells in the crypts of the labor comb in the small intestine, so you won't even see them in the liver, so they're trying to throw you off. And then sinusoidal uh, ep ep epithelial cells are cells um, in hepatic sinusoids, so there's the smallest vessels of the liver. The liver's a weird place because you're getting blood from your intestines and your lower abdominal uh, gastrointestinal tract, and you're filtering it so that it can go into the superior vent, into the inferior vena cava and the, uh, you know, it, it's cleaning your blood in a way that your, that your kidney isn't. It's, it's all the other way, all the ways that your kidney is not cleaning the blood and then it also has digestive qualities for, for your GI tract. And so, um, um, so fibrosis is, and, and cirrhosis should be, should be like one in the same in your mind. When you're thinking fibrosis, you should think cirrhosis. And the stellate cells, I don't know why, they love stellate cells. Um, another question they like to give you is if you ate a polar bear's liver, you know, um, and you, you, uh, you got too much vitamin A from eating a polar bear's liver, which is possible because polar bear's livers have too much vitamin A, then, you know, what, you know, what kind of cells would be overactive and you'd be, you'd be fibrotic because you're getting, you're having liver failure because you, you're hyper IG, uh, uh, vitamin A, um, and so, um, and so you're, you're eating stellate, stellate cells um, um, that have vitamin A in them, I believe. I think that would be the case, but I could be wrong. Uh, uh, but I think, I think the, the, uh, the polar bear thing might be wrong, but the stellate cells are the cirrhosis producing um, cells. Um, that's really the point of this question. And um, getting really familiar with Gamma glutamyl transferase, ALT, AST, alkaline phosphatase, liver function enzymes. Uh, Boards and Beyond does a really good one on liver function and physiology. At least they did before they uh, they kind of changed hands of ownership. I haven't tested. I haven't seen them since. But um, does that make sense? 
That was a very hard question. Um, so thank you for answering that with us. Um, so, uh, so who's next, Rwanda? Would you say? I'm trying to keep track. Rashad. Rashad. All right, let's do it. So, Bushan, are you here? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Okay, good, good. All right, let's let's try it out. Can you can you see this question? Yes. A forty-one-year-old woman presents to a farmer. Oh. Yeah. We've already answered this, so I'm going to get it right here, and they'll spend some action points, and we'll um, we'll we'll answer a question real quick. We'll kill this goblin. All right. So here's your question.
think it's 11, right? 22? No, it's 922. 922, okay. And so then recruiting histone acetylase proteins, what is that? Uh, histone acetylase uh, increases DNA transcription. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what recruits histone acetylase. Yeah, um, I'm trying to remember the drug that, that, that the, the cancer that is associated with it. Is it, uh, uh, the drugs for, uh, what's the disease for, the, one of the trinucleotide deficiency disorders? One of the... One of the trinucleotide deficiency Oh, 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 yeah. Well, those, those disorders have a, a cumulatory effect called, um, called anticipation. And that is regulated by histone acetylation and, and uh, um, methylation. But uh, methylation would, would deactivate genes and acetylation would activate them. Um, overactivation is a very cancer-like thing to do. Um, uh, we're talking about eosinophilic cytoplasmic inclusions. So I think those might be referring to... Um, uh, R rods. Do you know what? So inhibiting inhibiting pro apoptotic uh, factors might have to do with all trans retinoic acid. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. And so this might be R rods, which are like these uh, histological findings, which are kind of like sharp rods that you see in the lymphocytes. And so yes. I was thinking maybe. Maybe this was the answer. So I don't know the answer, but uh, you, you, you get to decide what we choose. Uh, what, what do you choose and what is your confidence? Uh, I'll go with B, yeah. B, all right, let's try it. So what confidence we want to do? Red, okay. All right. Yeah, so I, I agree. I, I think this is a very, very, probably one of the harder questions we've done. The spider's finally approaching us, so we got to get something right here. But this is, this. I was right that this is uh, acute promyelocytic leukemia. Um, and yeah, so we do have, I believe we will have um, ROS. So that's what they're talking about. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, and so... It turns out that RARA protein is a transcriptional factor as often functions of recruiting histone acetylase proteins. So they love these questions and taking them apart to a genetic level. So when you're learning biochemistry, it's awesome to learn biochemistry while you're looking into how do these leukemias work? Because you'll remember what a translocation is, you'll remember how, you know, um, how to treat these things better. If you're learning the biochemistry and learning these lineages and these biochemistry pathways in terms of DNA and RNA transcription, all of that. So let's talk about this a little bit. So I was right that this IL-3 receptor um, has to do with like the Philadelphia chromosome and, and, and it's 922. Okay. Yeah. So you're right. Yeah. So, um, and then 1418 has to do with follicular lymphoma. So, okay. So. Um, so that's B BCL2 there. And that's the pro-apoptotic -apop factors. So I was wrong about the, yeah, that's so, so anti-apoptotic factors describing activity of 1118 has to do with marginal zone lymphoma. Oh, that, it does the same as mental. So yeah. Lymphoma. Yeah. And then kinases has to do with cyclin D and, uh, because it's a tyrosine kinase that, imatinib is a tyrosine kinase that, that treats uh, Philadelphia, Philadelphia chromosome uh, people with, with, um, with um, chronic myelogenous leukemia, CML, 922 specific type. But um, this is a different kinase. This is a kinase that uh, the activity of cyclin D um, is, is the mechanism behind mantle zone lymphoma. Yeah, is the same, um, cyclin D is the same in both, but uh, in mantle cell lymphoma, it's, it uh, translocates with immunoglobin heavy chain, I think, on 14. 
Yes, yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, cyclin D has to do, yeah, so it's, it's part of a pathway that you should learn because one of the MBMEs tests on it, and I did see in the real thing, the real exam, you know, it, it's possible that there are questions concerning pathways, including cyclin D. Um, I can't speak about what was on my exam, but I can tell you that there are, is content that might, you know, involve, you know, cyclin D, um, uh, you know, that is high yield. Um, and it turns out that mantle cell and margin cell are slightly different. There's 1118 and then mantle cell is 1114. So, you know, I would do these questions as they come, but I would learn about 922, CML, ALL, CLL, and, you know, all of those four types of lymphoma very, very carefully, closely, learn the translocations that are involved with those, and learn the mechanisms like the B BCL2 protein, how that works, what, why is it, why is it imp implicated in, pro in, in, in hurting the pro-apoptotic factors that would allow you to get rid of these cells before they proliferate and become cancer? And so the, I think the best place to do that is pathoma. Um, but thank you so much for answering that question. That was probably, that was one of the harder ones, I would say. Um, so I, I just want to get through this. I want to kill this goblin, and then, and then we'll be pretty close to done. We'll, we'll kill this spider, too, uh, if we can. So Rowenda, who, who do we have next? Helen. Helen, okay. Helen, all right. Yeah. All right, are you ready? Yeah. All right, let's do it. I'm 35 year old woman, comes to the emergency room with a severe abdominal pain for the past three hours. She's in an obvious distress and reports that the pain is similar to that of previous kidney stone. She has had three episodes in the past six months and is extremely frustrated with her condition. The patient and nurses weight loss, a recurrent diarrhea, and painful rash on her leg. She denies fever, chills, malaria, and hematocrasia, and chest pain or nausea of the Her urine pregnancy test is negative. A non contrast CT scan of abdomen demonstrated a 4 cm stool on uh, at the urethra. What findings would you expect in this patient? Right, so what are you thinking? She has a stool of cancer at the urethra. Yeah. So here, um, she, has, uh, this is, um, she has a stool, right? Right, and she has distress. She has pain similar to the previous kidney stones. She's had three episodes in the past six months and extremely frustrated. She's a 35-year-old woman, right? And she also has a rash. Um, and so we're gonna look at that rash real quick. So we got a rash here, it's on her leg. I'm not sure I have very much to say about it except that it looks, what would you say about it? It's red, it's a little bit shiny, it's had, it has indistinct edges, it's not raised I don't think, and there's a little bit over here as well. It almost looks like a bruise, but it's too red, right? Yeah. So that makes it more macular than papular, you know? And so, and then we have a, we have a kidney stone here, so what, what findings would you expect in this patient? So. Proteus morabilis, what is that associated with? Yeah, stones, right? What kind of stone? What kind of stone is it associated with? So you're gonna have like a staghorn calculus? Stone. Yeah. Staghorn because it looks like an antler of a deer. Um, and so it fills like the, the lower, you know, the major papilla and the pupillae and the, and the, and the uh, kind of pelvic, uh, uh, pelvic um, uh, renal pelvis. And so we have that to think about. Um, what about B? Lymphoblasts in bone marrow. Yeah, 
So lymphoblasts in the bone marrow, um, you know, that would suggest some kind of lymphoma, right? Um, and you could get you could get kidney stones from lymphoma, so that's why they're putting that in there. Um, and then high levels of cysteine in the urine. Do you guys know why we would get cysteine? You, you could have cysteinuria, yeah, or homocysteinuria, um, which is a kind of a congenital disorder, um, but it's associated with some you know abnormal body habitus and and uh, and you'd have eye deformities as well so you'd be really slender you'd almost be marfanoid they call it because you look like a marfan's patient with a connective tissue disorder um, and then friable mucosa with ulcerations on colonoscopy do you know what friable means it's kind of like inflamed kind of red and kind of looks like you could move the skin if you wanted to, kind of brittle skin, with ulcerations on colonoscopy. So that would be kind of like if you had ulcerative colitis. And if you had ulcerative colitis, you might have a malabsorption. If you have malabsorption, then you can have like, uh, one of the things you can have is if you have, if you're not, if you're malabsorbing fat, then calcium binds the fat. And then calcium isn't binding citrate, and if calcium isn't binding citrate, you get citrate stones in your kidneys. And she's had recurrent diarrhea, so that's not a terrible option here. Also, with ulcerative colitis, you do get rashes. Do you guys know what kind of rash you get with ulcerative colitis? Exactly. So you said erythema nodosum? Yes. Yeah. You, you can't. Um, and then you can also get um, um, dermatitis or pediformis. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that is, that is the oh no, that's celiac disease, right? So this is the other one. Um, it's it's it, yeah, that's celiac. So that's this is not a vesicular rash. This is a different type of rash. Do you know what the rash I'm talking? You what? You can get uveitis, but a rash on your skin um, that, that, that is associated with uh, ulcerative colitis. And then cobblestone mucosa, do you guys know what that refers to? On what colon. Is it? That's Crohn's disease, right? So, so Crohn's disease is also associated with this rash. Um, I'm trying to remember the name of the rash. But it all have stone, like stones involved in it because of... I think it hurts like somewhere. Yeah, you can get stones from, um, well, the fat thing with the calcium is a malabsorption thing you can get from Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. Um, but you don't have any hematochesia, so it kind of suggests that it might be Crohn's more likely than uh, ulcerative colitis. But um, what are you guys thinking? So, so, so who's, whose question was this? This is Helen, right? So what you're saying? You're saying which? D. D. Okay. What confidence do you want to go with? Red. Red. Okay. All right. So yeah, it was it was one of the two, right? It had to be one of the two. Let's see what the rash is called. So this is you're right. Erythema nodosum is associated with it. I wonder if they'll mention the other rash. So this is erythema nodosum. It's a terrible picture of erythema nodosum, but that's it. Erythema meaning red, right? Erythema, red. And then nodosum, nodules of redness, is what erythema nodosum is trying to say. So we were right to call this ulcerative colitis. And this was, this, this cysteine, cysteine reabsorption in the PCT, can, you can have cysteinuria, right? Uh, this lymphoblast is acute uh, lymphoblastic leukemia, um, and you have increased cell turnover, so you're going to have uric acid stones, right? And then with Proteus mirabilis, you get a struvite stone, which is made of ammonium. They love to test you on this ammonium, magnesium, and phosphate, and that causes a staghorn calculus. Um, erythema nodosum is associated with calcium oxalate stones. So the thing I told you about calcium oxalate. 
that is the mechanism. You have a loss of fat. Um, you have fat. Fat binds to calcium because you're not absorbing it. It's in the GI tract. The calcium isn't being absorbed either. So you have a malabsorption of calcium. And as a result, your oxalate is free to be absorbed and deposited in the kidney. So you wind up getting oxalate stones, calcium oxalate stones. Does that make sense? So Crohn's disease causes you to not absorb fat correctly. As a result of not absorbing fat correctly, you have a buildup of fat in your GI tract that isn't going in your body. It's staying in your GI tract. And I'm going to draw this out because it's a nice lesson, actually. Just real quick, I'm just going to draw it because it's a really simple thing. But your body is a tube, right? You have your mouth at one end and you have your uh, rectum at the other. And so everything that's inside of the rectum, everything that's inside of the mouth, is actually not inside your body. It's actually just passing through your body. And so the fat, when it's not being absorbed, this is your whole GI tract. Your body's over here. Right? This is a really simple diagram of your body. So you have your GI tract, which passes through your body, and then you have your body on the, other side, on the outside, right? And so if the fat can't get out, because it's bouncing on the wall, it's not being absorbed, because you have Crohn's and the wall is full of fat deposits and it's being damaged, the villi is being damaged. You have Crohn's disease, so the fat can't get through. The calcium can't get through either. And so the calcium stays here, so the calcium in your blood, your vasculature is here, the calcium in your blood is being filtered by your kidneys. And when it gets to your kidneys, um, the, uh, the uh, citrate is, um, is at a higher concentration than your calcium because your calcium is not getting into your blood. And so citrate is becoming stones in your urine because the calcium would ordinarily bind the citrate and make it less available to the kidneys to be filtered out. So you wind up having citrate stones. And so she's experiencing this because of Crohn's disease and fat malabsorption. And the calcium's binding the fat and the calcium's not in the blood. And so it's not, and so it's, it's predisposing her to citrate stones. So it's kind of complicated, but that's, that's what's happening. Is that a little clearer than it was before? Yeah, that's, that's something that you just see it over and over and you wind up noticing that that's really a more of a Crohn's thing than it is an ulcerative colitis thing. And that erythema nodosum can happen in, in both Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. Um, so they're saying that recurrent kidney stones are also rare disease, rare as this disease does not affect the ileum. And so the ileum is where you have a lot of fat absorption. And so when you don't have that in calcium absorption. And so that's, that's, what, that's why this disease is more associated with it. Um, also, you'd expect bloody diarrhea. And they said we did not have hematochesia, which is, that's what hematochesia is. Um, so that was, a, that was a very tricky question as well, I would say. Um, but you won't get that wrong again. You, you just... You see these questions and you think, wow, step one's really hard. But once you've seen them, you'll recognize them over and over again. You really will. It, it's, it's, yeah. Um, so let's do, let's do, let's do one more question here. We're, we're, we're coming up on uh, several hours. Um, you what? Oh, okay. So increased cell turnover causes the release of so floating around in the cytoplasm of your of your cells, all of your cells, is DNA, and DNA is composed of adenosine, guanosine, uracil, and th uh, uh, thymine. And when you're breaking them down, you look at the biochemical chapter in the first aid. As you break down adenosine, it goes adenosine, hypoxanthine. Uh, xanthine, and then uric acid. And so when you break down a cell, you're releasing DNA, which is being broken down into uric acid eventually by xanthine oxidase. Xanthine oxidase converts uh, xanthine into uric acid. And so when this process occurs, you get a hyperuricemia, a hyperuric acid um, uricemia in your blood, emia meaning blood, 
and your kidneys filter them out. When your kidneys filter them out, you get kidney stones. And so with all the, what they call the soft cancers, the cancers that have really gooey, soft cells floating around in your blood, uh, if you ever get tumor lysis syndrome, which is when you're given radiation or chemotherapy and your cells, your cancer cells are killed by that, then you have cell turnover is enormous. And so you wind up having an enormous release of uric acid or at least a release of DNA that turns into uric acid. So one of the drugs that they use to prevent this is a drug called rasburicase. So if you ever have a, a patient that you know has high BUN and has just been given chemotherapy for something like ALL, one of the cancers that's soft and gooey, you know, uh, blood cancer is always that, that case, that is always true in blood cancers, um, then they might have uh, enormous cell turnover from the death of these cancer cells from the treatment. And so you would expect that DNA to be broken down into uric acid, but if you give case, the answer is usually case for those questions. And case converts uric acid to allantoin. And allantoin is a thing that animals produce from uric acid naturally, but that case would allow us to convert from uric acid into to allow us to urinate uric acid without producing stones. And so case is something that converts uric acid to allantoin and allows us to urinate it without having uric acid stones. So does that answer your, your question? Yeah. Yeah, so that, that's kind of a complicated pathway there, but um, let's, let's, do, let's do one, one, one more question if we could. Um, so so who, should we, who should we go with Rwanda here? Abidash. Abidash. All right. So I'm sorry to everyone if you didn't get multiple questions this time. We have a lot of people. We might split up into multiple groups if we have this much participation. Uh, so I appreciate everybody who's coming very much. Um, Abidash, you're, take it away. Uh, are you ready? Uh, yep, I'm ready. All right. Uh, let's try to... The... We might die while you answer this question, so let's... <laughs> let's try to kill him. So we, we have a 42-year-old. Are you able to see that? Uh, not yet. I think it's just when I show up. Okay. All right. I'll, I'll pause it for you. 42-year-old? Yeah. Yeah, I received now. So 42-year-old woman with a history of depression had eight presence to the emergency room with severe pulsating pain around the crown of her head the beginning a couple hours ago. She took ibuprofen two hours ago but did not feel any improvement in the pain. She has been nauseous and unable to get out of bed and is currently laying in the dark with the lights off. Her depression has improved and she has stopped taking her sertraline uh, two months ago. Other than ibuprofen as needed, she is not currently taking any additional medications. Which of the following would be the best treatment for her acute symptoms? Right. So what are you thinking? Uh, so this, uh, they're trying to get us to think about the three types of headaches that we know. Uh, so tension, migraine, and uh, the other one is cluster. Great. Uh, this kind of seems more in uh, favor of migraines, uh, considering uh, uh, like the improvement, uh, like about uh, keeping herself in the dark, um, and uh, severe pulsating pain. Uh, that does not respond to ibuprofen. So, in terms of uh, Great. treatment of those symptoms, sumitropan would probably be the most effective. And in terms of 100 percent oxygen, that would be for cluster headaches. It tends to be more common in younger males. Yeah. So Panelol would be good as a preventative measure for yeah. uh, um, like someone who has recurrent episodes. Uh, episodes of episodes of migraine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which you know, I'm just, I'm just pointing it out to other people. Um, oh, okay. So go on, you're doing great. Oh, and uh, you'd want to treat this because she's in uh, severe pain. Uh, she wouldn't be happy if you don't treat her. And, right. Uh, and amitriptyline, similar to propanol, I guess you can use it as a prophylactic medication. So and I would say, yeah, so amitriptyline is used how? Uh, I think it's used more like a prophylactic medication as well. Yeah. So like it has 
anti-muscarinic effects. It can cause, you know, uh, heart block. I mean, it can cause torsades as well. Um, and um, and it, uh, it also can be used as an antidepressant. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so she's having acute symptoms. So you would say that, like, sumatriptan is your abortive, and propranolol and amitriptyline are, like, your preventative. Yeah. And one of the things you use to, to identify this diagnosis, I'm just, you, you did perfectly well, so I'm just like, I'm just highlighting things that you said, is the pulsating pain is one of the things that you identified as a characteristic of migraine headache. Um, pulsating is one of those words they like to use to describe migraine headaches. Um, cluster headaches are extremely painful, but they don't last 12 hours. Um, they last like 30 minutes to 45 minutes. Um, if you stopped taking sertraline two months ago and your depression has improved, um, um, and so why is she lying in the dark with the lights off? Uh, that tends to, um, because, uh, because of photophobia. Right. Which tends to be common in my veins. It hurts, it hurts to look at the light, so she has photophobia. Um, and so, so all things considered, what, what answer do you like the most? Uh, I would say sumatriptan. Right. The only thing I can think of that they could, they could trip you up on is that amitriptyline is an antidepressant. Um, and I, I don't believe that they, she would need that because she's already, she's doing fine in that department. So what confidence would you have? Uh, probably green. Green, all right, let's do it. Perfect. All right. Let's see if they. Have, let's see how they. Why they. What they say about amitriptyline. Um, so uh, just so everybody knows, cluster headaches are treated. Uh, you can be treated like 100% oxygen for cluster headaches can be really effective. Um, so they like to use that. Um, that's like a, a cluster headache distribution is right on the eye socket. And then amitriptyline for chronic prophylaxis against both migraines and tension headaches. It is not used for acute symptoms. So it's 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 it's. This is a question I would say it's characterized as like abortive versus preventative drugs for headache and specifically migraine headaches. Um, and then this, this mechanism they love to test you on, 5-HT is serotonin. And so it's a serotonin 1B, 1D agonist. And, and so uh, it's a very similar mechanism to drugs like um, if you were to take uh, a drugs for erectile dysfunction you, you would take, you know, serotonin agonist that would do the same thing, but with a different uh, receptor for serotonin. And so you want to be careful and understand that, that uh, these drugs are serotonergic vascular modifiers. And um, so you, you think about that when, you're, when your patient has an MI, a recent MI or something like that. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kick him. And then I'm going to shoot him with an arrow. And we'll kick this guy. Why don't we kill this spider to end the day? And so we'll just do one more question. Do you guys mind? We'll come up on three hours as a result. Is that too long? <laughs> We're getting pretty tired, huh? D does anybody want to answer a question? All right. Let's, let's, let's call it a day. Um, and I just want to mention... Um, I just want to mention that uh, we do, we take donations. You can come a million times in a row and never donate. It's totally fine. There's no pressure in that department. Um, I also offer private tutoring. It is paid tutoring. It's not free tutoring. But uh, if we get more involvement, I'll have more groups uh, meet for step one throughout the week through group C. And, um, and we will soon have multiplayer ability. If you were to pay for private lessons or if you were to donate, um, you would be first in line to receive um, the beta version of the game that could connect you with adding friends and messaging and um, you could form a group of people to play these maps all together with, you know, it would be a beta version but it would be online studying with your friends talking about why the answers are the answers and uh, there's a lot of mechanisms that allow you to review the content. So I'm just going to show you a few things um, and uh, um, real quick, uh, just 
that things that you can do uh, reviewing the game. We're going to have a review game which uh, reviews the questions you got wrong. Um, and that's not functional yet, but basically it'll include one of these and give you answer choices down below. Um, I'm trying to show you one that has the answer choices. So he's still working on that, so that, that's kind of a work in progress, but you can see how we have, um, here we have one that's been obstructed and has the image. So this is probably toxic shock. So I would imagine that that's the thing. And so you would quickly race other people to answer those questions as review. So you, you all got the question wrong, so you'd review it together and you'd have chat to talk about it. And then in the game logs, you can look at the questions we just did. And we can look at neurology, we look at headache, and we have the highlights are saved, the answer choices that other people chose are saved, the date, the confidence that you chose them, and whether they were correct or incorrect, and you can flag questions. And so um, uh, if you do want to donate, it helps a lot. We, we have a few, quite a few donators. We have a few links that, she can, uh, that Rowenda will send to the group after the session. Um, it really helps a lot. And then um, talk, contact me or Rowenda on Facebook if you would like to uh, receive private tutoring. Um, and uh, we, we have a sliding scale for different people and their affordability for hours of uh, tutoring. Uh, if you do a group tutoring, it's a little cheaper. And, um, and I look forward to having more sessions. We, we have a session every single week of the year. And we're going to consider doing two, two sessions a week if we have numbers like this every day. Um, so you're welcome to come to the set two sessions. Do you guys have any questions for me? All right. Well, thank you so much for coming. Um, have a great day. Thank you, guys. Yeah, thank and thank, so thank Rwanda if you get a chance. She's, she's helping a lot. All right, see ya.